Okay. Welcome everyone to this uh, 48th annual New England Medieval Conference, Teaching the Middle Ages, Pandemic Lessons and Post-Pandemic Pedagogy, which is sponsored by the University of Massachusetts, Boston and the Harvard University Standing Committee on Medieval Studies. My name is Alex Mueller, one of the co-organizers of the conference. I'm an associate professor of English at UMass Boston. I'm a scholar of Middle English literature um, who teaches courses ranging from Chaucer to King Arthur, as well as a former high school English teacher who directs our English teaching program. To begin the program, one of my colleagues and now Dean of Faculty, Rajani Srikanth, Shrikanth, Rajani Shrikanth will offer some opening words of welcome to all of you on behalf of UMass Boston. I'm especially thrilled that these remarks will be offered by Rajani, who is herself an inspiring teacher and scholar of the literature of human rights, as well as a specialist in pedagogy, with whom I have had the pleasure of co-writing an article on teaching literature called Constructing the Innocence of the First Textual Encounter. Rajani. Thank you, Alex. That was so sweet. Thanks for the wonderful things you said about who I am. And I want to say that working with Alex and having Alex as a colleague is, is truly, really inspiring. And I'm going to tell you exactly why now. But first, let me introduce you and welcome you virtually to the UMass Boston community. And um, I know that you're very excited about this conference that is being co-sponsored by UMass Boston and Harvard University. I'm not myself a medievalist, but um, Alex has been very passionate and persuasive about uh, convincing me that the medieval period is a, a really exciting time of um, emerging phenomena and um, ideas that have persisted to this day that we really need to pay attention to. And of course, from the perspective of a human rights scholar, who can forget the 1215 Magna Carta by King John, which is considered in the Western world, certainly one of the founding documents that allow us to imagine human rights. Um, and I didn't realize this, but again, um, I think sometime in 19, well, 969 was the founding of what has now become the city of Cairo. So that's very exciting too. And I didn't realize that that was sort of a, a really momentous kind of occurrence um, during the Middle Ages. And for people who are not medieval scholars um, like me, um, we always think about the Middle Ages in relation to those beautiful illuminated manuscripts. Um, and especially today, I think about how much is, well, I wanna say how much is lost, but I'm gonna actually correct myself in a few minutes, but how much is lost by not being able to journey to the rare books archives and actually see and feel the materiality of these beautiful illuminated manuscripts. Um, but, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what this moment, this pandemic has brought us and taught us. And I know that for medieval scholars, certainly the pandemic has made it possible to go back to uh, Boccaccio's Decameron and think about what we can learn from that text. And it has made a lot of medieval scholars feel suddenly very relevant and very important to understanding how we as various societies um, on our planet are reimagining our futures. Um, I too have you know, wondered and thought, okay, all of us have had to shed our discomfort around technology. Not Alex, who's always been a great technology guru, but I certainly had to, had to learn how to handle technology. And I've been thinking about some of the advantages that has afforded me uh, in my teaching. And I know that those of you who teach the material culture of the Middle Ages have found yourself able to bring to your screens some of those really important objects from the material ages, not the least of which, of course, are these illuminated manuscripts. And you're probably feeling like, okay, now we don't have to make those journeys to these archives to, to find these. Our students have access to them in the same ways that we have had access to them. And suddenly, you know, the ease with which technology allows us to look at these material objects has made us feel okay. So maybe it's not such a bad thing after all, you know, to be confined in our homes. 
But, you know, I have been wrestling with that ease of access and thinking about what it perhaps takes away from us. And so another phenomenon of the Middle Ages has allowed me to think more about what this moment means. And I wanted to share with you my own feelings about the pilgrimage, which as you know, is a really, really important kind of phenomenon of the Middle Ages. And I've been thinking a lot about pilgrimage in, in, in the sense of it's um, the spiritual quest for understanding and meaning. And I have particularly felt that what we're going through right now requires us to undertake pilgrimages of various kinds. Uh, pilgrimages into our own consciousness and imagination uh, to figure out what we want to prioritize in our lives. Uh, pilgrimages to reach out to those who are unlike us, uh, whose realities are unfamiliar to us, and do the hard work um, and live with that hard work of connecting to others. And I know that every society, every country is imagining or taking, undertaking this pilgrimage. And I'm thinking about all those folks sitting in Glasgow now and hoping that they're bringing to their inquiries this, um, you know, the determination, the introspection, and the real intellectual and ethical kind of quest for what is the kind of world we wish to um, rebuild and reimagine for the future. So I wish you all just a lot of, um, I don't know, I guess pleasure in taking this intellectual journey together for the day. Um, and I hope at the end of it, you, you find those things that will help you flourish um, and welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajni. Um, I wanted to introduce myself uh, real quickly. Um, I am Sean Gelsdorf. I'm the um, uh, administrative director of the Committee on Medieval Studies at Harvard University. Um, and uh, I'm one of the co-organizers of this conference together with Alex. Um, and uh, I'm here to welcome you and also to welcome uh, the second of our introductory speakers today, Nicholas Watson, who's the Henry B. and Ann M. Cabot Professor of English Literature, and I think more importantly, Chair of Harvard Standing Committee on Medieval Studies. In addition to being an internationally recognized scholar of Middle English Literature, Medieval Religious Writing, and Vernacular Studies, Professor Watson also is a generous, wide-ranging teacher and advisor his courses address vernacular poetry, women's spirituality, dream visions, and much more besides. And it's an honor to have him kick off this year's New England Medieval Conference. So I'll hand things over to Nicholas. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and I'm, I seem to be having trouble with lighting today. I'm rather rather moody in my, as, as far as <laughs> I see, so I apologize for that. Um, Rajini, thank you. Those were wonderful words that you just said and um, very, very apropos. And in fact, you said many of the things I had been going to say, which is good. Um, but um, I would like, of course, to welcome everybody. Um, many friends here, um, um, scholars and teachers from all around New England. Um, and this is a wonderful sort of moment to have a reaffirm a kind of regional community of medievalists. Um, and I, I think that's that's an important thing as well. And we're very proud at Harvard to be co-sponsoring this event with, um, you know, UMass Boston. Um, and those co-sponsorships, I think, are also a, a sign of, of the kind of solidarities that um, this conference has always stood for um, and that we need to stand for more than ever. I agree entirely with Regina. This is a time of contemplation um, for medievalists um, where the Black Death analogy was made very early both by medievalists and by others and has proved both horribly apposite in some ways and very much inapposite in other ways. Um, um, and of course we're still waiting to see um, how <laughs> apposite it will turn out to have been in the end and we're waiting to see I think in some ways what kind of event we have been living through and are still living through. And so in many ways, anything that could be said today is bound to be in the nature of an interim report. Um, and also uh, a moment when we can check in with one another and do one of the things I think we all have learned definitively um, 
fairly definitively over the last 18 months, which is that we need to think about the work we do um, in relation to present urgencies. Uh, we need to find resources in the materials we study to confront present urgencies. We need to be able to show how that might be to our own students uh, and to other members of our communities. Um, and these are um, in relation to the kinds of texts I work on in the uh, medieval era, which are mostly uh, Christian religious texts. These are, these are both contemplative concerns on one level. So they, they take us back into ourselves. Um, the, the metaphor or fact of pilgrimage is one of the modes in which the contemplative experience can take place. And there are also pastoral urgencies. Um, they're about how we communicate um, our materials, but also our care about our materials and our care for our students through that communication um, in classrooms and elsewhere, including in this kind of space, um, which is a space we've all got to know rather better than we had hoped. Um, I had the experience last week of, of having to revert to Zoom because of a graduate student strike um, at my university where um, it feel, felt it's crucially important in supporting the strike not to ask students to cross picket lines and not to do so myself. Um, and um, I happened to be teaching Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk, and so it seemed an important class not simply to cancel. Um, so we moved to Zoom for the class, and um, after this vibrant set of classes in person, wearing our masks, not being able to see one another's chins. Um, have you noticed how people's chins don't look right when they unmask, if you see them out in the real world outside? Um, after that vibrant period, we then we then moved on to, on to Zoom for one class and had this glum, uh, this glum hour of looking at each other, chins and all, um, in little squares as I'm looking at all of you. Um, I was on leave last year when the pandemic teaching that I'm sure almost all of you here did. Um, I, I had three month, uh, two, two, two months of Zoom teaching at the end of the previous academic year. So I actually don't know what you all went through um, in much detail and I'm profoundly grateful for that fact. Uh, but I, I think coming back to a campus that's still kind of waiting to discover what the new normal is, coming back to a world of uh, uh, scholarly communities where we're still waiting to discover what the new normal is in relation to conference travel. And there the Glasgow um, climate change events, loo uh, climate change discussions loom very large because we have to think more responsibly as scholars um, whose carbon debts um, through conference travel um, are in fact a measurable <laughs> phenomenon in relation to global warming. So we may have to get used to these kinds of rooms and work out how to maximize their benefits. Um, we're still really in the middle of some of these discussions and we're the, we're the beginning of others. So I think that sentence went wrong in some way and that's probably a sign I should stop talking and uh, welcome you again. And uh, I'm looking forward to these discussions um, and to hearing what people will be saying and um, I will now hand back to, I think it's to Alex I'll be handing back to, but thank you very much indeed for inviting me to open this conference. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for that. And thank you, uh, Harvard Standing Committee for your sponsorship of this conference. Um, I wanna offer a few words of introduction to the topic of the conference, as well as the, the structure of, of each session. So, while other conferences recently have had to make the abrupt transition back to virtual meetings in the wake of the Delta variant, um, the president, uh, Miriam Pages, and the steering committee of the uh, New England Medieval Consortium made the prescient decision months ago to avoid this eventuality and to, and to conduct a kind of, of unconference on Zoom. Um, one that would deviate from past practice and offer more opportunities for conversation than the normal presentation or lecture-based conference structure would afford. 
Um, moreover, it seemed important to take this opportunity to reflect on the experiences of trying to teach the literature, culture, and history of the Middle Ages, I mean, periods often defined by plague, as has been mentioned already, within the midst of a pandemic. For some of us, this meant converting our face-to-face -face courses to online ones. For others, it meant, despite the increasing health risk, attempting to carry on teaching in person. And yet for some others, it meant a bit of both, teaching high flex, a combination of face-to-face -face and online teaching. Our panelists, who come from a range of institutions throughout the Northeast, have offered to share their experiences of doing so which may or may not have resulted in some kind of instructional innovation, but did lead to some kind of pedagogical revelation. We have therefore designed three pandemic lesson sessions. The first one is teaching literature, which will follow this introduction here. Then teaching material culture, which is the second session of the morning. And then after lunch, teaching history. Each session will begin with presentations by two panelists who will share their teaching tools or strategies that they tried during what my, Sean, uh, what my colleague Sean Gilsdorf has aptly called the age of COVID or the long 2020, which is my personal favorite. Um, then the moderator will lead a facilitated discussion, asking the panelists to respond to quest questions such as, what have you learned about your students during pandemic teaching? What have you learned about yourself as a teacher? What have you learned about your subject? How do you believe your teaching will change going forward? So each session will end after that uh, facilitated discussion with the moderator with an open discussion when we will invite all of you to ask your questions and share your own pandemic lessons. Following the three sessions, we will conclude the conference with a, a roundtable discussion with all panelists which will give them an opportunity to, to talk across sessions and begin to define what we might mean by a post-pandemic pedagogy. So a few uh, procedural notes before we get started. Um, so each session will last one hour um, and we've planned a 15 minute break in between. Um, and uh, we will take uh, an hour lunch break after the second session and we'll resume our afternoon sessions using a second Zoom link. There are two Zoom links because we are recording this um, and we will be uh, eventually uh, uploading these videos to the Middle Ages for Educators website. We'll mention this again um, throughout, you know, later in the, in the conference, but this will be an exciting opportunity to share the work of the NEMC and make our ideas that, are, that, that come forth here more widely available to those interested or actively teaching medieval subjects. Um, during each session, we have, uh, ask that you remain muted during the presentations and facilitated discussions. But, and when we open up discussion, we encourage you to uh, raise your Zoom hand um, if, uh, it, when possible and when we call on you to turn on your cameras and speak your questions, if, if possible. Um, we will be monitoring the chat, but uh, depending on how many questions we get, we're going to try to privilege those that are going to, to be able to speak the questions because we really want to engage in some, some dialogue here um, as best we can. Um, so, Sean, I think that's, that's all I have. Um, do we want to take a quick break or do we want to proceed directly into the first session? That's a, uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> uh, I feel like the, I kind of feel like the bus driver who gets to his stop a few minutes too early and then you have to decide. Yeah, we're, we're here a just bit get, early. <laughs> should you just be like early on the route or are you going to tick off everyone who shows up on time for their bus and it's not there anymore because you moved on? Right. Um, uh, I think we could probably wait for a couple of minutes just because I know that some participants are going to be showing up. Um, and I see that uh, Miriam has raised her hand, so I wanted to acknowledge her. Miriam, can you unmute? Hello. Hello, everyone. There might be a lot of noise coming uh, from my end. I apologize. I just wanted to use uh, this opportunity to remind everyone who is on the steering committee um, that um, the steering committee um, 
An annual meeting is scheduled for Friday, November 12th at 12 p.m. Um, I, it will be a virtual meeting, of course, and I have sent the Zoom link um, via email. Um, so you should have the Zoom, Zoom link if you're on the steering committee. I know not all of you can make it, but it seemed to be the time that most people that um, took the poll could actually make it. So that's why I scheduled it for that time. So I just wanted to remind everyone of that while we're still here. And, and thank you so much, Sean and Alex, for, for everything you're doing. You've, you've done such an amazing job and uh, I've done nothing to help you, but this is wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and thank you to to Miriam, Miriam Pages from Keene State, who is the outgoing uh, president of the New England Medieval Consortium, which is the host of the New England Medieval Conference each year. Um, and at the end of this meeting, I just wanted to mention quickly that Alex, our own Alex Mueller here, will become the, the new president of the NEMC. So congratulations in advance to him on his uh, on this richly, uh, richly, I don't know, is, that, is it deserved or, or suffered? I'm not sure. But anyway. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought you were a co-president with me, Sean. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry. No co-presidencies. Um, and I would yeah, also like to, I would also, <laughs> I'd also mention real quickly that uh, those of you interested in the work that we do, uh, I encourage you to, we do have a website. Um, it's uh, New England Medieval, all one word, dot org, uh, which has uh, information about our conferences, our past conferences, upcoming conferences. Um, and so, you know, please feel free to visit there. Um, we, we really are, we're, we're the medievalist organization for the Northeast. And I think it's very important that those of you who are sort of active in, uh, in New England um, be involved as much as you can. We encourage you to come to our conferences. We encourage you, if you're interested, to reach out to us and join the steering committee, which always needs new members. Um, we always need new blood and we would uh, welcome your, your insights and your input. So I just want to say that as well. And I've now successfully wasted three minutes. So uh, I think we could probably start, Alex, if you want to start a few minutes early. I think we should, because I, you know, the sessions always uh, go longer than we anticipate. So, and, and the sessions we are keeping fairly short uh, as, at an hour. So if it's okay with you, Georgia, I will go ahead and introduce you. Uh, so let us turn to our first session, Teaching Literature, which will be moderated by Georgia Henley, who is Assistant Professor of English at St. Anselm College. Her current book project, Reimagining the Past in the Anglo-Welsh Borderland, Borderlands, forthcoming with Oxford University Press, examines how Anglo-Welsh families reimagined the Welsh past in order to influence the political landscape of the Welsh borderlands. She is an ACLS fellow for the 2021-22 academic year, um, which is a, a great, great uh, award, um, very competitive award. Congratulations on that. And her courses on medieval literature draw upon her interest in medieval book production, paying close attention to how the handmade book influences our understanding of medieval literary culture. She teaches studies in medieval literature, legends and myths of King Arthur, Imagining the Middle Ages and Modern Fiction, and Introduction to General Linguistics. She also teaches Introduction to Literary Theory, First Year Writing, and Introduction to Literary Studies. So I'll hand it over to you, Georgia. Thank you so much, Alex, and thanks to everybody for, uh, for coming on a Saturday. Um, I've just been reflecting on the fact that I've, I've been teaching online at this, my current job, longer than I was teaching in person before I started. I don't know if that's anybody else's experience, but um, teaching on Zoom is, is, uh, has been the reality for us for so long that I'm, I'm very glad that this event is happening um, so that we can kind of process uh, the experience together. Um, so as was mentioned earlier, um, the structure of the session will be that each, each speaker will, will talk for about 15 minutes each, and then the three of us will discuss the, um, the pre-circulated questions, and then we'll open it up for discussion with the general audience at the end. Um, and maybe we will wrap it up on time at 10.30. Um, so our first um, speaker, I'm very pleased to introduce Arthur Baer, um, who teaches medieval literature at MIT, uh, including uh, Chaucer, Arthurian literature and Old English, broad surveys of poetry and drama, and a co-taught interdisciplinary introduction to ancient and medieval studies. He recently received funding to incorporate online learning modules into his Canterbury Tales class, and he's hoping to develop an, another class on medieval Iceland and its sagas during his next sabbatical, uh, which cannot come soon enough. Uh, so um, thank you so much, Arthur. Thanks so much, Georgia, um, and to Alex um, and Sean and, and to all the organizers. Um, uh, 
Poetry defamiliarizes language, um, making it strange and sometimes uncomfortable. Um, and that effect is enhanced by Middle English, which is itself a strange, uncomfortable version um, of the language we speak. And for me, the pandemic did something similar in the sense that it made teaching itself strange and uncomfortable. Um, I rely a lot on, on the sensory and the somatic um, when I teach, sort of reading facial expression and body language, working the room, um, modulating the energy. Um, and much of that felt at least impossible over Zoom. So it also felt um, uncannily appropriate um, that the first text that I taught online was the Middle English Pearl. Um, since that poem is all about making the familiar strange. This happens um, at the level of individual words, broad concepts, familial relationships, everything. <laughs> um, it's also a poem, of course, about death um, and the impossibility of touching those we love. Um, and all this made it an incredibly poignant um, experience because, uh, because even through a screen darkly, I could see my students' fear and bewilderment and um, anger in some cases. Um, emotions that the Pearl Dreamer experiences as well, except that I felt totally unequipped to play Pearl Maiden. Um, and initially I tried to make the Zoom room as much like a regular classroom as possible, but that did not work very well because it it turns out medium specificity really is a thing. Um, and it wasn't until I started experimenting with using video for its affordances um, that things started to go better. And at first, these were just little video footnotes um, to class discussion, three to five minutes that I sent out um, in which I expanded on a point that we hadn't fully explored and maybe with a pivot uh, to the next class. And my goal was mainly just to keep the conversation going between sessions, um, thereby hopefully conducing to a sense of community um, that felt impossible otherwise. I should say that this was a six week seminar on Pearl that started um, after spring break. So these were students who had never met one another. So many people who taught in the spring of 2020 had that first half of the semester to kind of build a rapport that they could sort of then ride out to the end of the term. Um, I didn't have that. So I felt a little bit the kind of canary in the coal mine for what so many of us then did experience in fall when many of us were, were fully remote. Um, I think those videos helped um, build that sense of community to a, to a degree, but I was actually surprised by how much they seemed to help on a substantive level too. Um, students just seemed to be getting the poem better. Um, and that made me think since I was teaching, I knew I was teaching my Canterbury Tales seminar that fall, that is last fall, um, that I wanted to think how, about how video resources might help there too. Um, since the way I learned Chaucer, which was therefore also the way I mostly taught Chaucer, um, which was like throw a glossed editions of the tale at, at them and just tell them to keep calm and carry on until they get it, um, that always seemed to leave at least a couple of students behind um, linguistically. Um, and since the complexities of Middle English are so integral to the power and beauty of, of Chaucer's poetry and indeed all um, beautiful Middle English poetry, that seemed like a shame. So I was excited to make Zoom videos that would kind of guide students through some of those linguistic complexities. Um, and I want to just share uh, about eight minutes of one of those um, videos. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Hi, everybody. So in this little video, I'm going to take you through a very brief passage of The Knight's Tale, um, beginning with just one word um, and opening outward a little bit from there. Um, so to the extent that this is a deep dive into a single um, interesting Middle English word, um, it's a version of the kind of work that you're doing, that you're already doing in your Middle English word guides um, with the MED. Um, to the extent that it works outward from there to consider, to begin to consider at least, um, a whole short passage, it's a version of the kind of work that I'm asking you to do in your Middle English uh, class reading exercises. Um, so do watch it um, carefully and um, we'll discuss further in class. So I'm going to begin um, by sharing my screen so that you can see the passage that I'm going to talk about. It's from the beginning of The Knight's Tale, um, just eight lines as I said, and I'm going to begin by reading it out loud. 
And it's this, it's this word Ron Saka that is um, gonna be where I'm gonna start my uh, attention. So, to ransack in the tops of bodies data, then for to strike of harness and of weda, the pillars did them busyness and cure after the batila and com discomfiture. And so befell that in the toss they found through girt with many a grievous bloody wound, to younger knichtes lidging be and be, both in own arms, broch or region. Okay, so here you have a word that looks very much like modern English, ransack, being glossed quite differently in our edition of the Canterbury Tales, glossed on the right-hand side of the page, as search. So this is exactly the kind of moment that I've already asked you to be aware of, of when you have a, a word um, that looks like it has a clear modern English reflex being glossed as something quite different. So, this is the perfect time to go to the Middle English Dictionary. So let's go and type in Ron Saka. And we see that we get a verb, which is great because it's being used as a verb. And here are all of the senses of the word. Um, and you can see there are many um, to pursue an inquiry, investigate, determine, examine a wound, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second meaning to make a search, search through, study, search over, um, and that's the meaning that we were given by the by our editors. But then you see that meaning C, the third meaning, to plunder, ransack, rob, steal, um, that's far closer, in fact, ransack, um, that's far closer to uh, the modern English um, meaning. So let's take a look at the quotations to see when these meanings are attested from, make sure they all would have been available to Chaucer writing in the late 1300s, and you can see 1390 for the first uh, meaning, 1325 through into the 1400s for the second, um, and 1325 through into the 1400s for that third meaning. Take a look, though. Here we have the very passage that we're talking about. Toronsa in the toss of Bodius data and for to stripe of Harnai son of Weda. So what this, and this is being glossed as an example of meaning C, the plunder ransack rob meaning. So this is super interesting, right? Because it set, it tells us that the editors of our edition of the Canterbury Tales on the one hand and the creators of the Middle English Dictionary on the other have reached very different interpretive conclusions about the meaning of this word in this particular context in the Canterbury Tales. Both are legitimate in the sense of being attested elsewhere in this time period, but depending on which you choose, they have very different, um, they set up the tale, right? Because remember, this is how Arcita and Palamon, our two protagonists, um, or at least two of our protagonists get introduced. Um, depending on how you read that word, it sets up that introduction of the two knights very, very differently, right? So let's go back to, um, the, uh, to the text and take a look at another interesting word. So right here we have Toronsoc, which I would, I am with the MED folks, I would gloss this as plunder. Right? Um, so to plunder in the heap of dead bodies, so as to strip them of gear and, um, and clothing, the pilors, which are edi our editors lost scavengers, deed in busyness and cura, we'll come back to that phrase in a moment, after the battle and the defeat. Um, so pilor is probably a word you don't recognize. Let's go back to the MED and type that in. And what do we find? We find um, this first meaning, a plunderer, pillager, despoiler, um, one who deprives others of money, goods, etc., by the undue exercise of power or authority, a ruffian. Um, and I don't think we need someone who peels. Um, that's clearly not what's, what's going on. Um, and again, here we have this same passage that we're talking about, which um, our editors gloss as scavengers, but um, the MED folks gloss as pillager, plunderer, despoiler. Um, so between these two examples, we see that um, you've got 
the editors of the Canterbury Tales have given us far more neutral, I mean, scavengers is, you know, slightly negative, arguably, but far more neutral meanings of these two words. Um, and the reason I go into this in such detail here is because um, it's only by, so by only providing those most neutral, least negative senses of the word, um, the editors are in effect tilting the playing field. It's almost like they're not giving you a full data set to use um, sort of science and, and engineering type um, vocabulary. Um, and as a result of you not having that full data set, you have the potential to be misled, um, albeit innocently, um, arguably the latest. Um, and this is what, but, but, but right, by using the Middle English Dictionary, by having a fuller sense of the history of the English language and its vast richness, what I'm trying to do is give you the tools to um, not to be misled um, by the editors. Um, and that's really what studying literature at an advanced level in a seminar like this at MIT is all about. It is giving you the tools, teaching you how to um, read in ways that like get behind or pull aside the curtains, as it were, um, past those um, textual apparatuses that make the text easier by making it less complex, and in so doing, inevitably distorting it. Um, now, there are always going to be forms of mediation um, it's not as if anyone, myself included, can have kind of a pure uh, appreciation or understanding of the text. There's always going to be sort of veils of, of one sort or another. But you should end this seminar and any literature seminar um, more confident of your ability to recognize what those interpretive levels are and how to work with them to understand the text more completely um, and more fully. So that's, um, and it goes on from there to talk about some other, other phrases um, along those same lines. And obviously I could do this in the classroom and I have done a version of this in the classroom, um, but it, that eats up almost 15 minutes that could be otherwise given over to discussion. And more importantly, doing it live doesn't allow students to go back and review the material on their own. Um, for example, as they move through the scaffold, the scaffolded assignments in the class, um, from the Middle English word dives to the larger close reading exercise, and from there, of course, to the final um, paper. Um, and that ability to re-watch seems really important to me, um, since it's generally the students who enter with less preparation, um, linguistic or otherwise, who struggle to read Middle English with real confidence and fluency. Um, and gaining that confidence and fluency in turn empowers everyone to talk back to our editions um, and thus implicitly to the text itself. Um, so although I don't think the content here is innovative, um, making it available in this form does have the potential to make the classroom more inclusive, um, leveling the playing field by giving everyone the ability to work as needed um, outside class on the, the nitty gritty of Middle English. Um, modules like this also, I, I hope, will greatly expand the energy I can put into um, focusing on um, the sound of Chaucer's poetry. Um, sound matters to all poetry, of course, um, but especially to medieval poetry, which was often uh, composed to be performed orally. Um, and it's especially significant to the Canterbury Tales, right? Um, since, it, since that depicts pilgrims um, bickering amongst themselves um, between the tales told on the road to Canterbury. Um, but learning to declaim uh, Chaucer's poetry is hard and correcting each mispronunciation sort of line by line and student by student is, a, is an inefficient and frankly dull use of class time. So um, videos of me reading aloud would let students practice on their own and at their own pace um, and then record their own versions um, for me to assess, um, perhaps even stage a, a live performance of some sort of especially juicy bit of roadside drama. Um, above all, I'm excited to share more of this work through the world uh, with the world. Um, 
uh, not just through um, the uh, the Middle Ages for Educators site, which is which will be awesome, um, but also through whatever form MIT's hallowed um, open courseware uh, or OCW um, next takes. As some of you probably know, MIT and Harvard recently sold their nonprofit um, open access course platform to a for-profit company, um, and what, from what I can tell, rather a scurrilous one at that. Um, and in response, many faculty um, at MIT, and I suspect Harvard as well, have opted to remove their course content um, as a way both of making a statement and hopefully gaining leverage um, over the shape of this still-to-be-determined nonprofit entity um, that will replace whatever we had before. Um, now, I don't think very many people come to uh, OCW looking for Chaucer, um, but to the extent that they find him uh, for free, um, I think that's a good and powerful thing. Um, so with that, I think I'm, uh, I'll wrap up so we have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Arthur, for that really interesting presentation. And I'm sure um, all of you in the audience have uh, things you want to talk to him about, but we'll save that um, for later in the session. Um, and uh, now we will um, hear from Albert. Um, so Albert Yore is an assistant, uh, sorry, an associate professor of Spanish and Catalan at uh, UMass Amherst, where he teaches graduate classes on topics like early modern reimaginations of medieval texts, poetry and the production of space, and textual and editorial theories for digital environments. At the undergrad level, he teaches classes on medieval and early modern Iberian literatures and cultures, including the survey of pre-modern Iberian literature, which he will speak about today, and upper level courses on ethical readings of erotic literature, otherworldly travel, and the production of space in lyric poetry. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Albert, for being here today. Thank you, Georgia, for the presentation. I'll be sharing my screen. I've prepared a slideshow. Um, let's get also my script ready so that I don't lag. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm going to talk about how I converted my introduction to medieval and early modern Iberian literature, Spanish 320, from a face-to-face -face class into a course to be taught remotely with both a synchronous and synchronous components. Um, let's see. There we go. This will be the contents of my really short talk. Uh, I want to preface it by saying that I am teaching in a Spanish program uh, at a large public university, so my choices were very much determined by the technology uh, I have, I had available, uh, the composition of the student body, or the kind of class I am teaching, as you will see. Um, other conditions would have made me do things differently, and what I did prepare to uh, redesign the course uh, would not necessarily translate well in other settings or there will be other uh, better options. I found some, some very clear benefits in my teaching approach last year uh, that uh, can uh, easily get uh, lost now that I'm teaching again face-to-face -face. and teaching back in the classroom obviously has many other benefits we were all missing it. Um, at the same time, in hindsight, some of the preparatory work it did to avoid certain problems to care of issues that might not have uh, presented themselves in the first place, but nonetheless were overall, overall uh, beneficial. So at UMass Amherst, we have the Center for Teaching and Learning, which supports faculty and course design, classroom instruction, curriculum development assessment. They're a wonderful resource, and that was particularly clear in the late spring of 2020 when it was um, we were all beginning to look at the fall semester as, as, as a period in which we would be teaching remotely. Uh, they created a resource that is not online anymore, unfortunately. They have recently changed their website and moved that, uh, uh, that content. Um, the, the, the resource were a series of pages uh, guiding faculty in rethinking how our classes would be most effectively, effectively delivered remotely. Uh, in this process, I also consulted with one of the staff members of the CDL, Brian Baldi, who was, as always, incredibly useful. So here's a shout out to him. Uh, let's talk about uh, the curriculum that the course covers. Um, after considering how to adapt my course for remote delivery, I decided that of all the options I could follow, the one that may bring the most advantages uh, would be teaching my class asynchronously. 
in the end, as I said, uh, it ended up being mostly, but not totally a synchronous, but we will get there soon. Teaching the classes synchronously was the first and most important decision I took, which I did all the preparatory work for the semester and the uh, thinking of my class. Following the CDL advice, the concerns that guided my choice of that delivery method were that uh, not all my students, if they had to be studying mostly from home, would have access to a fast internet connection in order to be on Zoom comfortably three times a week for almost one hour. I was also concerned about international students, students from other time zones in the US who would be taking classes uh, at a different time. And the last point I could more easily address <clears throat> asynchronously uh, was supporting my students as learners of Spanish. We'll see what implications that has. So Spanish 320 is a survey of the literatures and cultures of medieval and early modern Iberia. We read a selection of texts from the 11th uh, through the 17th century. Uh, the course selection of texts uh, uh, to be read, which I keep changing over the years, is meant to be epistemologically representative of the cultures of the period. They were written in a variety of languages, including Arabic, Latin, Catalan, or Castilian, or Spanish. We read them in Castilian or in Spanish translation, and the 13th and 14th century works I offer in a modernized uh, version. I teach in a Spanish program, which means that the undergraduate literature and culture courses I teach are designed for students of the Spanish language, most of whom are non-native speakers, some are heritage speakers, and they all have taken at least the equivalent of four semesters of Spanish in college. Spanish 320 is a four credit class. Most of our courses have three credits, so this one is more intensive. It can fulfill a general education requirement and it's taken as an elective by both uh, Spanish majors and minors. So how did I used to teach it? I, I, I used to teach this class in a very conversational way. I would pre-circulate questions about the readings of the day. It meets, as I said, uh, three times a week. And I would ask students to read the text, take notes, consider those questions and be ready to discuss them in class. I would explain historical, theoretical concepts and uh, the texts, but I would not give lectures. The content would be gathered collectively and inductively as a result of the text commentary and group discussion. Uh, in this class, we discuss texts as historical beings. We study them in relation to the moment and place in which they were produced as to how they were illuminating or are illuminating of the medieval and early modern past. But we also try to remark on the relevance across history, which has changed for all of them, and particularly their significance uh, in the present. For the later purpose, I moderate five online, or I moderated five online uh, forums across the semester in which students participate and discuss the relevance of those texts with regard to present day questions of race, religion, gender, or class. We look, for example, at the antisemitism of some Christian works or the way the idea of reconquest of Christian lands from the Muslims is flawed and indicative of an ideological point of view that is often co-opted by the inheritors of General Franco's fascist dictator uh, in Spain. Discussions of texts were solidified in the essays uh, they have to write, or they had to write in which they have to argue in favor or against an interpretation of the text I propose or several texts sometimes. So what did I change for the fall of 2020? Um, uh, since uh, uh, I, how, do, how did I change it into a synchronous one, right? Um, we would not be meeting to over text regularly. So now um, I uh, had to create lectures to introduce authors, works and readings. Uh, I used very simple technology. I began recording my lectures on Echo 360, which is a software available to us at UMass to create, archive, and manage recorded lectures for our online courses. Both, uh, we can record those from the classroom, special classrooms, or in front of your computer, which is what I did. Then the lectures can be streamed from the students' computers. And although I have a 5G connection, the recording of the lectures directly into the Echo 360 servers was not always smooth. So I began using a simple free video editing program, Flashback, and uploading files as I finished recording and editing them. Um, I also assigned many more videos than I would normally do in class. I included short documentaries in open access, like this one, 
created by Ryan Speak from the University of Michigan, but I also included short documentaries from the Spanish public television and theater and film adaptations of some of the works we were reading. Not that I was not assigning this material before, but I included many more than I would normally do that. I would normally, I would have used those materials as supportive material, not mandatory. Um, one key challenge of asynchronous teaching is I learned engagement in order to foster it and make sure that the texts were read and understood. In addition to the periodic essays and the online forums, I assigned short graded activities for every single text. Here, um, sometimes uh, those activities were simply written questions. They had to answer and turn it in, the anti-plagiarism software we use. But I also incorporated, incorporated other software uh, and activities such as voice thread questions. For those of you who don't know it, voice thread is a software that allows you to have discussions asynchronously in which students record short answers to prompts that can be an image or several images, a text, or a recorded uh, video, which is what I did. I recorded my prompts. It was a great way for students to practice their speaking skills. As I said, um, one of the goals of the class are learners of Spanish and is improving um, their, uh, all of their skills. Um, I also created annotation exercises and very simple software on Google Docs. Um, after reading a text and listening to my lecture, they would go in a Google, Google document and explain the meaning of keywords and fragments of the text. And they could also supplement each other's explanations and work together in interpreting readings in ways that would be later helpful for them to eventually write their essays. Last, I also created a wiki within Moodle, which is the learning management system we use. Uh, the wiki was asking students to keep uh, building a thesaurus of concepts they were learning through the semester. However, eventually, since this activity was not associated with any specific input, text, or clip, and since there were already 36 short exercises that were responsible for, in addition to the essays, which I reduced to three instead of five, and the forums. So about two weeks before the beginning of the classes, I deactivated the wiki and edited the syllabus to eliminate it from the class. Uh, one fundamental element of the course that had lots of implications was my effort to enhance the accessibility to the audio-based materials. There is no reliable automatic closed captioning system in Spanish in the instructional software we were using, not in other platforms I explored like Flipgrid. And closed captions are important for learners of Spanish in a content course in which you cannot just repeat what you say or write a word uh, on the blackboard if you're working asynchronously, right? So I had to create scripts for all of my short lectures. I had to write my lecture first, uh, edit it, record the clip, edit the clip, and then upload the materials to Moodle. I also uploaded the slide presentations and the transcriptions, uh, also the transcriptions of my prompts for voice thread. So the Moodle page looked a little bit like this. Each oral piece of content was enriched with accessibility documents, which make it bulk here. Uh, but this proved helpful here with the link to the Echo 360. There's the script, also the PowerPoint, the same for the prompts, right? Um, the other major change I had to make involved uh, the contact and homework patterns of the class since I would not be seeing my students regularly in class and there were more, many more graded activities that there used to be in the face-to-face -face version of the course. All my all work was due on Fridays at midnight except for the three longer essays which were due on Sundays. Um, I started the week with a Monday morning message in the class forum which they would also receive the, in the email. And in those messages, I announced the topics and readings of the week and spelled out uh, the activities linked to each e-reading. On Wednesday morning, I would send a reminder along some kind of additional supporting material to the content of the week, such as a link to a newspaper article, YouTube video, even silly memes sometimes related to the readings, which for them was something new for many of them seeing those memes about classical text and in Spanish. Um, on Friday morning, I would send the last minute reminder of what was due by midnight and on Saturday morning, I would record a 15 minute video wrapping up the contents of the week and also taking into account their performance in the activities. I would point out, point out the common mistakes or points of confusion uh, I had found in their answers to the activities, right? So um, I would also anticipate what they would be seeing the following week. Last, when most of the materials were ready for the beginning of the semester, my fears that creating an entirely asynchronous course would not help my students be totally engaged in it which had been growing on me over the summer, just became unbearable. So 
Uh, the week before classes started, they took together the syllabus and the organization and introduced a synchronous component in the course. We would be meeting once a week on Mondays to keep them engaged in the class. Uh, in the Monday morning meetings on Zoom, at the time when the class was originally scheduled, Eastern Standard Time, we would be having introductory activities related to the reading of the week, but not requiring any reading in advance. The main goals for those activities were to prepare them for the work, work they would do on their own and fostering a student-to-student -student interaction. I also used those asynchronous sessions to give them time to plan together how to write on the topics of the essays when due dates were closed, or I would go over common mistakes they had made uh, in their essays. So I'm now getting close to my conclusion and I will talk about what went particularly well in my class and also what I, uh, about what I had to change pretty, pretty early on in the semester. Um, the reorganization of the work could not have produced really better results. I was really pleased. In fact, a TA comfortably taught the class with the same structure and materials in the spring. And I have numerous students of, in my 400 level of activity semester who took 320 with me or my TA last year. Here you can see some of the week at a glance infographics I created, spelling out the activities students had to do every week. Um, students remained engaged across the semester. Rarely did I have to send anyone a reminder of a missing piece of work, and they loved participating in, in the Monday meetings too. Uh, voice threads were probably one of their favorite activities and a huge surprise for me. In the spring, I tried to use Flipgrid instead, which is a great software, more intuitive and user-friendly, and it encourages video recording over voice recording, but Voice thread worked better for this class. I think it is because there is an obvious advantage in not having to look at yourself on the camera and focus on what you're saying and how they felt really comfortable reading uh, and quoting as I have to make them do from old texts they're learning to pronounce as well. Um, uh, surprisingly, there was really only one thing that needed tweaking and I did it early in the semester after the third week. The recap video uh, message was not working. I posted it on they posted it on, on VoiceThread instead of doing it on Echo 360. I could see how many students were watching it, and it was between three and five in a class of 22. So that turned out to be an overkill. Instead, uh, what I began doing was recapping the week in my Monday introductory message. In that, I would be mentioning students' answers to the activities of the week and highlighting their names in both, uh, and this change meant one less interaction per week, but it seemed to be just enough as they were already not, not missing any assignments and following the class really, really well. So that's it. I hope I've given you an idea of how I transformed my class and look forward to continuing the reflection with Arthur, Georgia, and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert, for that uh, really uh, Rich presentation on on the class, and I and I come away from both of these presentations wishing that I could be your students, um, in at your school. So, um, what we'll do now is move into uh, this the sort of structured discussion uh, portion of the session. Um, so, I'm going to ask um, our two speakers um, each of our four questions uh, that we have set. Um, and I think we'll just go through the the questions uh, one by one, and then at around ten fifteen. Um, we will open up discussion to the entire group. Um, so the first question is, uh, what have you learned about your students uh, during pandemic teaching? Um, would either of you like to start with that? I can start. Sure. Um, what, what I've learned from them uh, is that they... Uh, they craved a sense of community that was very dif very difficult to convey from the distance. And it was in those really small things, like what, what Arthur was mentioning at the beginning of his talk, how you move in the classroom, how you make eye contact with them. Uh, uh, even for, as I explained, those synchronous sessions I, I was giving, I was giving sort of a regular class considering that there would be a lot of things they would be doing on their own. But th that's impossible to have that, right? The, the, that contact there in the screen. And you could see that they were craving that um, in the way they were participating. Like they would compensate, right? Normally in the forums, in, in the, 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 when, when I have those in face-to-face -face classes, um, they participate, they know what they have to do. But I have to be on top of their, I have to remind them that they have five days to participate, that um, punctuality is part of the grade. So they have to write their first uh, contribution early in the week, etc. 
I didn't have to do that <laughs> uh, last year. They really wanted, and they were a lot into writing more about what each other had been writing. They, they were trying to compensate what was missing. I could, I could see that uh, there very clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I, that idea of um, the students building their own communities, I really observed as well. I, I, I um, for the first time, I had um, a component of the one of the components of the seminar was that each student had to work in a team of um, three or four to lead a mini class um, for 40 minutes of the 80 minute seminar at one point in the semester. And they had to come up with a class plan, which we, which they discussed with me. Um, they then ran the class and then they all had to do a write up um, individually of, you know, how things had gone, what they'd learned, et cetera, et cetera. And they were assessed on, on all of those things. And I was stunned. I was, I was, I mean, I wasn't stunned because MIT students are pretty amazing, but, but I was stunned also at how um, creative and um, engaged they were. And I think part of that was because of exactly what Albert says, that the, the pandemic made them and the fact that they were all dispersed all over the country and indeed all over the world um, made them really crave that. But I think having gotten the taste for that, um, they haven't, they will not have lost that taste um, going forward. So that, that's something that, um, that I plan to, to, to continue. Um. Yeah, I, I agree um, with this, the sense of the students want, like just craving connection with each other and with with you as an instructor it was was really noticeable and it's not something that you ever really need to try very hard to do in person but you could I could just tell that they just really wanted that sense of community um it, it's in such a fragmented moment in their education and something that worked really well for me was breakout rooms and I know that we're you know we faculty are terrified of breakout rooms in our own <laughs> meetings but um th that was the best way that I found to approximate kind of small group discussion um before um I, I would pre-circulate questions and have the students work on like discussion questions with each other in breakout rooms of five people each um and then we would come back together for the full class group discussion with the same questions and so they would have something prepared that they had talked about and I just got the sense and I would sort of pop into each breakout room and I got the sense that they just really liked just talking to each other in the sort of low stakes um, environment of just of just five people and they got to know each other through through the zoom class throughout the semester and that was a really lively way of creating community but it's certainly not something that comes naturally um, the way that it does in a in-person class. Um, okay, so great. So let's now move on to the second question. Um, what have you learned about yourself as a teacher? Well, something that may be a little embarrassing to share. So maybe if you give me the seconds, I'll say something else, but then I'll share it anyway. So I felt uh, I, for, for the class, the way I, I, I organized it, I had to correct a lot. Like, Everything was prepared. A lot of the content was prepared in the summer, but I had I had to keep um, uh, correcting uh, lots of small exercises and then keeping track of what everyone was contributing, so that at the end of the week I could somehow make them feel that that I was not only paying attention to them individually, but as a group we were moving on with certain issues we have dealt with, certain questions they had um, discussed, understood or not quite. So I had to correct. Um, and uh, I felt that for all I like uh, uh, teaching in person and I'm enjoying it so much, uh, I, I, when I think about how well it went last year, I feel great, but <laughs> I prefer doing what I'm doing right now. Uh, I care too much at, at the way they react or are in class showing, re uh, reacting to uh, more boring parts of the class dynamics, others that uh, they're interested, you know, all the distractions that are, uh, for all, for, uh, so I'm, I'm making my message clear, for, for uh, how much I love to be interacting with my students, sometimes the negative feedback or the lack of, it, this can be something really short, right? The lack of interest at certain moments of the class that 
I've realized that puts me off more than I thought. And I only realized that because I did not have any of that feedback last year. I wasn't seeing how they were reacting to my, to my lectures. I wasn't seeing what readings they liked better or worse. I was just seeing answers. And, and it really, and they worked, by, they worked a lot. They had to, they, when they come to class to discuss questions, sometimes they participate more, others not so much. They had to react to every single piece of input, right? Uh, and I, I really liked the feeling that I, I could see some sizable engagement with the text that was not punctuated by moments in which they were not engaged in it, right? So I, I did not know that about myself. I really care about my students. I, I really like much more what I'm doing this year than what I did last year, but it, there was a relief in not having to receive that occasional negative feedback. Okay, this point, this is getting too boring, but I love this part, or I love this author. Like what, I have to move on. I have to make something different. Like why? I don't want to do that, right? I did not have to do that. Uh, last year at all, right? So this is something I learned about myself. Not necessarily positive, but it's what it is. I, I feel like um, I've been, um, so so my, my transition back into teaching in person has been, uh, has not been super seamless. Like I have felt actively rusty in the physical classroom um, It uh, in a way that I, um, that is, is, um, I think rightly, you know, it, it's humbling, right? To feel like, oh, like it, I, it feels, so I was a figure skater and it, it reminds me of when I would, I, I, you know, I, I had a groin pull and I couldn't skate for like six weeks and I got back on the ice and I was a different skater. Like it was, not, it was just not as good. And it just took a while to build up those muscles, um, rebuild those muscles um, and I think that that, I think, I feel that many of our students at MIT, um, my students, and I've talked to other colleagues, um, are also kind of rebuilding those in-person muscles um, in a way that is um, awkward and embarrassing and often and, and kind of they're, they're, I feel like I feel more exposed in the classroom now than I used to. I think my students also feel more exposed. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't, I don't, I, and what, what, so what, the, how do I turn that into an answer to the actual question? Um, what have I learned? It's that um, it, this is all more fluid and dynamic, um, this practice that we're engaged in and, and kind of continuing to relearn. Um, so, and that's, I think, should, should prompt in all of us a kind of degree of, um, epistemic humility, as the, as the philosophers like to say about next steps. Yeah, that's, that's great. Humility is certainly something that I think that we've all felt a lot of in this, the last eight, eight, 18 months, as well as the, I have kind of like a half-formed thought about this, that essentially the classroom experience is kind of an agreement between teacher and students that it sort of creates this temporary reality that's based on the agreement between this group of people. And it can happen in, in any environment as long as the students are showing up and it's really them that are making it into a class, not, not you with all of your knowledge and, and, and experience. Um, so that part about it was, is very humbling as well. Um, okay, so let's move on to the third question. What have you learned about your subject? I'll, I'll start maybe. I've learned it's really, really, really hard. Like, I think I did, I think teaching just the kind of like momentum of my career and as a student and then a graduate student and then a, a and then a VAP and then a professor kind of made me able to not notice the degree to which Middle English is actually genuinely hard. <laughs> um, because it's never framed as hard, um, or at least never, it, it never was to me. And, and, and so I think um, that's been, that's been really also humbling, but also really enabling and really um, cool to discover that there, because hardness is, is fun um and mit kids especially are just like the hard the difficult is what they want right 
So leaning into that difficulty um, of the language itself, um, I think has been um, even quote unquote easy Chaucer um, has been really, um, uh, really um, useful. I'll, I'll change a little bit the question, uh, but what I've learned more of my subject of the way I teach my subject, um, I realized how little I used to and still do rely on uh, big concepts that uh, historical, theoretical not so much, but historical concepts that help, right, that give students a shortcut to interpreting texts and understanding the period. For instance, um, and, 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 and still, and I'm, not, and I'm not sure how much, I'm still not sure how much they need that. Uh, in, 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 in this survey class, which I keep teaching, uh, we cover texts from the right, 11th to, to the 17th century. Um, and then, uh, I, I'm not sure that constantly, you know, talking about periodization, which I do not do because in a way I take it for granted that they've gotten that somewhere else. Uh, I'm not sure if that is something I should do more, but I've realized this missing from the way uh, I approach the teaching of this um, of these texts and, and and of this class on this subject matter, I do I I do not uh, I find that there's this big periodization concepts are missing also aesthetic wise from uh, from from my last from my lectures from my commentaries from what 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 is because and and I'm realizing <clears throat> that maybe I'm taking for granted too much and that they should be more present somehow but if they need to be present they need to be introduced and if you need to be introduced you need more time to present them so i i really do not know uh, so what i was trying to say and i'll finish is that um uh i've i've realized how much of how i engage with the prof with with my subject does not contribute to um and so i it, in a way it reflects in my classes does not contribute to big um, um, discussions about uh, periodization issues, which, what, which for a survey class may be more important than 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 I than I had realized before. Thank you. Um, and then our last question: um, How do you think that your teaching will change going forward, based on this experience? Well, since we're supposed to end at 1030 and no one else has gotten in, I'm just going to say in the ways that I said and leave it at that. Yes, I'm not sure. Um, we can we can have discussion with other people to talk about that and later, uh, later on too with other speakers. Okay, we'll leave that question open then. Um, are there any um, comments or questions from uh, the audience? Yeah, Miriam. Hi, sorry. Um, so um, this isn't, I don't know if, I think there's a question in there, but I'm not sure. I, and I, I hope it's okay. I, I, I thank you so much for your wonderful presentations, um, Arthur and Albert. Um, and it was um, so enlightening. And both of you did so much work on these remote remote courses. I, I feel just so humbled um, by um, by by all the work that you you both did on on your your courses as a result of the pandemic. Um, the common part, I guess, is I was, you know, as I was listening to you, I was comparing um, to my own experience and um, my own experience, actually, I kind of expected a lot of the things that you said in terms of kind of the differences, that there would be um, huge differences in the reactions and um, there would be differences going back to um, in-person teaching. Now, my experience was a little strange because I was on maternity leave just before the pandemic. Then I was still on maternity leave at the start of the pandemic. Then I was on sabbatical in the fall of 2020. And then I came back to teaching in the spring of 21. And that was remote. And now I'm back to in-person teaching in the fall of 21. So I've, I feel like I've done it all. <laughs> but um, 
but for me, it was actually surprising how much my class remotely was still very much like my in-person classes. And it was also surprising to me how easy it was to go back to in-person for me. And I haven't noticed amongst my students either that there's been too much trouble with them. They feel like they're acting pretty much the way that I remember them acting prior to, you know, my going on maternity leave before the, the pandemic. So, so it's been surprising to me because I was very nervous going back to the classroom at the beginning in September, in, in August and September. And I thought that it would be terrible and it's we I, we I felt like we all just kind of went back to the way we did things before um so so that was that was that for me and and in terms of remotely again I did none none of the work that you guys did and I feel terrible admitting this but um part of that is my teaching method methodology that I'm very um I'm a kind of teacher that I like prepare questions of course and topics that I want to um, deal with but at the same time I'm also hoping that the students will you know be able to kind of take the discussion in the direction that they want so I've kind of I try most of the time like the thing that I have to do in class is try to like try to figure out how to switch gears like I was ready to talk about this but now they want to talk about that so how do I kind of make that jump so I was able to continue doing that remotely and in person um, but for me the big difference was having two children at home during the pandemic. And I don't know, maybe this is just me, maybe nobody else is in that situation, but having two children at home, you know, in the fall of 21, my oldest had finally returned to school. So that was great. Um, my sabbatical was pretty much like helping him do virtual teaching, um, learning, I guess. Um, and then my youngest was of course at home. So it was, I was like, sometimes I was actually teaching and taking care of my youngest at the same time. And most of the time, you know, I was, I wasn't doing that, but I would have to like jump in and then jump out and like be ready to switch those roles so fast. And that was what I found truly exhausting. And now being at it back in person, I hand my child over to the daycare workers and I go to my office and I have a few minutes and then, you know, I teach my classes and then I have a few minutes and then I go pick him up and, you know, it's tiring, but it's not the same. So I was just wondering if, I don't know if this is like something that we could talk about now or if we were going to talk about later, but I wonder if, I was wondering if there was going to be any space today to talk about that, about that, the craziness of that situation and how exhausting it was. <laughs> I actually have a medical condition and like last year I had three seizures when I haven't had one in years before because it was just so insane and I every five months I'd like forget my medication and I'd have a seizure within a few minutes. <laughs> it was insane. I'm sorry that's probably too much information but um, but it was just I think telling you what was happening. Thank you, Mary. I'm so sorry uh, for, for for what you've been through and for what so many of us have been through. I'm kind of getting PTSD feelings, remembering that that complete chaos, the level of chaos and identity confusion that, that was happening when we were working from home. Um, does it, do any, either of our speakers or anyone else want to speak to that, Albert? Yeah, very, very quickly. That, I mean, that when we went home spring 2020, have two little uh, girls at home and they was directing uh, uh, the Spanish program, Spanish and Portuguese studies. It was a mess. It was a, and that's why I decided to use my summer, preparing it to be delivered asynchronously. Because then I could uh, say whatever happened at home with daycare. Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't have to be at certain times, except for the meetings. Like I could really work around much more flexibly. That I didn't mention that I should have. That was one main reason why I decided. Another reason, not only thinking of my students, but thinking about myself. The spring had been so hard, so ridiculously difficult that I thought, how can I make this easier for me when I don't know what's going to happen? So okay, I'll have all the materials there. They'll work on them. And look, this also has all these other advantages. Uh, so yeah, I, I totally feel for you, Miriam. Sorry, I didn't mean to like make this a pity story, but I just think we've all been through this, all of those of us in that situation. Absolutely. Sean? Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on something that, um, that Albert had mentioned, and, I'm, and I, I was thinking about this too, when I was teaching online, especially teaching literature, the courses I teach are kind of hybrid between literature, history, and other things. And I hadn't really thought about it until you said it, but it was the, the difference between being on Zoom and teaching those, those seminars versus being in the classroom. I hadn't really thought about this before, but when, when I'm in the classroom, that scaffolding you talked about, like contextualizing, because if you teach a thematic course, one of the problems you always run into is your students come to the class often with no background at all in medieval anything. Um, and certainly they don't have, there's no prereqs. So you're teaching a course that spans, that goes maybe from the one, one of the ones I teach goes from antiquity 
like the biblical antiquity up to the 16th, 17th century. It's this huge span of time. And you're reading these texts that, as you said, Albert, in a sense, there's a sense that you have to historically anchor them. Like there's, they come out of a, out of a world, right? And there's a set of expectations and values and everything. And it's always a problem to how do you do that in a way that doesn't just turn the class into a lecture course or into a, like two courses, a survey class to teach them all the background and then a seminar to discuss the, the readings. And I've always tended to go towards the, you know, mostly it's just, we discuss the readings and we let it fall where they may. But I always found in person, I had a lot, I felt like I had more freedom and I don't know what this is about it, but maybe it's about the haptics or the somatics or something of being with people that I could kind of read where they were confused or that they didn't pick up on something or that there needed to be more background. And I could kind of, I always felt like being with them, I could kind of sense that and I could kind of fill in and I felt more free to sort of ad lib that kind of information in. And I felt it was really hard, I found in Zoom, because you got these little boxes and it's really hard to read people. And you were, I was so self-aware. This is, you know, eventually, I, I mean, a part of it, I was turning off my camera on myself helped. So I wasn't always looking at myself talking. Um, but even then I always felt so self-conscious about, you know, I feel like I'm rattling on, you know, I'm just, maybe I'm rattling on and in person too. I just don't feel it as much. Um, but, you know, it's like, oh, let me get, like, there's a sidelight. Let me go explain this thing. Like, well, this is why he's saying so-and-so. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I found that's one of, the, was one of the real struggles of virtual teaching is that I, and this goes to some of the things like what, what Arthur's been doing. I found myself prepping a lot more and preparing things outside of that classroom experience to have them as ancillary, just to kind of give them this stuff, which I'd never really thought to do before. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> It's different than giving them a textbook. It's like giving them a set of like a, a set of, of of an apparatus, right? To to build around. And you know, I, I'm curious whether one of the things about like what are you taking forward from your teaching? I think that it sounds to me like for both of you, I, I suspect that some of that work, that kind of intentional work of kind of building an apparatus, is something that you're going to kind of hold on to. I certainly am. My my course websites look a lot different now that I'm teaching in person. There's a lot more stuff in them. There's a lot more things I can point to and say, if you have an issue, like to go look at this thing, there's this really interesting page about this manuscript we were looking at, and you can learn more about it there. And if you have questions, you can get in touch with me. But I just feel like I'm, I'm much more aware of that sort of, that need my students have that I always just kind of did on the fly. And then I suddenly was realizing it's hard to just do that on the fly, especially on Zoom. I'm curious whether you had a similar experience. This goes to that whole sort of dynamic of being in person versus being online. Thank you, Sean. I think you explained really well why it why it's so much more work to create as a, an online class than an in person class because you have to sort of create all this apparatus in order to approximate the feeling that you would get from just breezing into your class with some lecture notes, right? <laughs> Which is what we're used to. Um, so that yeah, that's a really useful explanation for why it, it's so much harder to to prep for the online class. Um, and we have a question uh, from Mary Dr. Miller. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Uh, sorry for not turning my camera on. Um, but first of all, I wanted to sort of echo what what I said in the chat, which is that this past hour has been really wonderfully validating for me to hear other people have had many of the same experiences that I had in the past year. I'm hoping uh, maybe uh, some of our, our panelists can talk a little bit about how they dealt with student mental health issues, because that was absolutely huge for me last year. And I had the entire dynamic of students who were dealing with depression and anxiety to such a, a, an extent that they couldn't come to class on Zoom. Um, or when they were there, I wasn't even really sure they were there because they were the cameras were off and they were muted and they weren't actively engaged. And then I had a bunch of students who I really felt like, you know, 930 on Monday and Wednesday morning was the reason that they were bothering to get out of bed. And, and not just my class, but all their classes were providing a structure to their lives that the pandemic had, had ruined. Um, so I, I'm wondering, uh, how did our, our pet, did, did you experience the same thing and, and how did you deal with it? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I, I suffered from depression and anxiety at, at various points. And the, the moment I got tenure, um, I included a mental health policy um, on my, uh, syllabus um, that basically said, I have a very strict attendance policy because um, it's a discussion class. You have to be in class in order to discuss the material, um, but that everyone can miss one day of class. No, except no, just all you have to do is send me an email that says I'm taking my mental health day. And it's specifically to kind of perform 
um, belief <laughs> that mental health is a form of health, um, which is something that MIT itself, the Institute, um, really has a has deep seated issues with but 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 higher education generally it's not it's not obviously specific to MIT um and um yeah I I think it was it was it was a huge issue I mean I I had to basically radically restructure my Chaucer seminar in the middle of the semester um and to be frank I'm having to radically restructure my Arthurian literature class this semester so this is not something that is in our past um, and, you know, I, I mean, my, my, my wonderful friend and colleague, Diana Henderson, who's, who's, who was here at least, and maybe still is, um, said basically like her attitude toward this semester was like, if, if anyone learns anything about Shakespeare, great. <laughs> and I think that's, that's a different kind of humility than, than the, than some of the others that I was describing, but like, as, you know, um, as teachers, especially those of us who, who pride ourselves on being kind of intense, you know, we, we teach the stuff and we're, we're intense and we're rigorous and all of that. There has to be a kind of letting go of pedagogical and personal ego in order to react and recognize that that's what the students need. And if, and if, you know, I, I dropped Sir Gawain and the Green Knight from my, from my syllabus this term and anyone who knows me at all <laughs> knows how painful that was. But um, yeah, so that's my, those are my thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much, Mary, for bringing that up. I think, and, and for Arthur, for your comments about ego, I think that's absolutely right that we, we sort of, like, oh, I found myself just dropping all of the sort of punitive aspects of my attendance policy and my, you know, my deadlines. It was just like, if you can get this in by the end of the semester, I will grade it. If you, if you want a, you know, a, a B plus instead of a B, because you're asking me about it at the end of the semester, of spring 2020, great, have a B plus, right? That just, it, and just not having any expectations for people showing up to class every single day. And I think we have this fear that students will take advantage. And, and I just decided, well, like, well, okay, so maybe if one student takes advantage of this when they shouldn't have, that's worth the other 12 students who felt some degree of relief that they, that they weren't being punished for, for not being at 100% of their capacity. And I think that, that that was worth it to, to release that sense of ego, right? To say that, like, to validate their experience of their, of their mental health suffering during the pandemic that that was worth letting go of all of those kind of things that we used to care about um, like attendance um okay does anyone else have any any final thoughts or comments or want to add something about this mental health issue um okay i think uh in that case uh we will wrap up uh this um morning session uh, um sean and alex do you have anything you want to say before we take a break. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks, everyone. I, I have a feeling a lot of these issues, of course, are going to cross over. And I think we're going to be having discussions about some of these big macro things about classroom dynamic, about grading, about what to do, you know, sort of compassion and and what Hannah Weaver in the chat very aptly called pastoral, the pastoral care role of the teacher um, throughout the day. So I think that these will be discussions that will be ongoing. Um, we'll take a quick break now. Um, with, let's come back and we'll start right on time at 1045 with our next session on teaching material culture. Uh, in the meantime, everyone uh, feel free to go, um, as I said you know, earlier, walk the dog, uh, make some coffee, um, you know, stretch your legs, whatever. And we'll see you all back here in a bit. So thank, yeah, you. And thank you very thanks, much. Deirdre. Yeah, Thanks, Albert and, and Arthur, for a terrific uh, session. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. So uh, this is our second session. It's on the teaching of material culture, which is what we're going to see is, a, is really kind of a fascinating, poses fascinating potentials and problems, um, right? Because we're in living in a virtual moment where when you're someone who works with things, how do you do that uh, effectively when there's no touching, uh, you know, either uh, touching of bodies or touching of objects? How can you do that effectively and what kind of challenges do you have to overcome? Uh, leading our discussion today is uh, Jacqueline Jung, who's the 
specialist in medieval European art and architecture at Yale. Um, she teaches lectures and seminars at the undergraduate and graduate level on topics including Gothic cathedrals, art and the body, representations of others, uh, art and emotions, and a survey that's called Medieval People and Their Art, which I think is a cool name for a survey. Uh, about 10 years ago, she took over the old, as she describes it, old-timey ancient and medieval survey course uh, from the renowned Vincent Scully, not to be confused with baseball announcer Vin Scully, um, but supplanted it about three years ago with a broader introductory course that's uh, called Art and Architecture of the Sacred, a Global Perspective. She's constantly fine-tuning it and learning a lot along the way. The pandemic year brought her into the realm of video production as she converted that class into a series of video lectures involving a lot of, of multimedia content and hours and hours and hours of editing. And she notes that she is still recovering from the experience. Uh, so thank you very much, Jackie, for leading this discussion. And I'll hand the virtual podium over to you. Thank you so much for um, uh, having allowing me to participate um, in this really interesting and productive, and I think um, strangely therapeutic um, set of conversations this afternoon, Sean, and to, to all of the organizers and everyone who's here. Um, I just want to, I guess we should just get into our conversation because we really want to hear from these uh, these speakers. We have two people um, talking today, Megan Cook and Eurydice Giorgantelli uh, from Harvard, and I'm going to um, introduce them as in not together, but in the order of, uh, of their presentations. Um, we'll start with Megan, uh, who is one of the co-organizers of the, the third person in the triumvirate, uh, an associate professor of English at Colby College, where she teaches undergraduate courses on Chaucer, sex and death in medieval literature, the global Middle Ages, and the history of the book, as well as first year writing and introductory literary studies. None of this, she says, has very much to do with her research, which focuses on the transmission and canonization of Middle English poetry in the early modern period. She's the author of The Poet and the Antiquaries, Chaucerian Scholarship and the Rise of Literary History, which came out with Penn in 2019, and with Elisaveta Strakov, Strakov co-editor of John Lydgate's Dance of Death and Related Works, which also came out in 2019. And this is freely available online for all of your 15th century Middle English death poetry teaching needs. She's now going to tell us a bit about how she dealt with the material. Well, I'm curious to hear about how um, in the literary field, you're dealing with material culture um, objects, but then specifically how you adapted to the pandemic. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I am going to get myself sorted here. Um, looks like we're good. Um, so thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for that shout out, Sean and to Sean and Alex uh, for really doing the yeoman's work um, of organizing our gathering today. So I'm going to talk over the next 15 minutes or so about a class um, on medieval manuscripts that I taught during the spring semester of 2020. I'm going to approach it from three different angles, uh, what I thought we were going to do, what we actually did, uh, and how I plan to approach this material when I teach the class again uh, this coming spring. Uh, ultimately, I think the central uh, dilemma for me is one that most of us face uh, in our classroom, pandemic or no, uh, how to balance the access that digital tools can give us to medieval materials uh, with intentional uh, attention to accessibility in course and assignment design. Um, and I'm going to read from a script because I love talking about this course and I've given like three different presentations on it. And if I don't follow my notes, I'll get off track. Um, so I'm going to start, however, um, by saying a bit about the class and um, my overall goals, goals for it. So my research uh, is as a book historian and a specialist in late medieval poetry and involves significant work with late medieval Middle English manuscripts. And I wanted to, to teach a class about them for years. Uh, three things held me back. First, I teach at Colby College, which as many of you will know, uh, is a liberal arts college of about 3,000 students in central Maine. Um, side note, it's very beautiful here. I do want to know that next fall, um, our meeting will be at Colby. Um, come up, uh, it'll be like peak color season. Look at some leaves, uh, drink some beer, talk about medieval uh, culture. It'll be great. Um, but uh, we do not have any medieval codices on campus. 
So this meant that any course on that topic uh, was already going to need to feature primarily digital engagement with medieval materials. And following on this was my own uh, concerns about the limits of my skills as a digital humanist, which would mean that I would need to rely on the skills and tools of others to facilitate this digital engagement. Third, uh, and I think this is common for, for probably all of us, um, many, if not most of my students uh, are taking their first class in medieval culture and literature when they come to my classroom. So there's not a lot of common knowledge to draw on. Uh, nevertheless, I applied for and received a grant uh, from our Humanities Center to teach an experimental lab course in medieval studies. Uh, and this was during the 2018-2019 year that I applied for this to teach it in spring 2020. Um, the lab course designation meant a few things that alleviated some of my concerns and exacerbated others. Uh, it meant that I had extra support from our amazing academic uh, IT staff uh, I, that I could design the course without worrying immediately about our new course approval process, and that the course would be promoted to students across campus through Colby's Center for Arts and Humanities. This last point is important because it meant that I would likely have an even larger number than usual of non-majors in the class uh, taking it for a literature distribution requirement. So, I went into planning this class with some ambitious goals. I wanted to expose my students to the fundamentals of medieval manuscript study. I wanted them to learn about how a manuscript is made, to explore the codicology and structure of early books, and to develop some basic paleography and transcription skills. Through that transcription, they'd be introduced to textual studies and the concept of variants across manus manuscript witnesses. At the same time, in this proposal I wrote, uh, we'd hone our visual analysis skills to discuss mise en page and basic iconography. And students would be introduced to Middle English poetry and develop their close reading skills. And I would turn the lack of medieval codices on campus into an opportunity to build literacy around critical DH, discussing the ways that physical objects are mediated through digitization technologies, um, and uh, visiting the digitization rig uh, that we have in our library on campus. So um, to lend some cohesion to these wide ranging objectives, I decided that our class would focus on a single manuscript as a case study over the course of the term. Uh, at the time I was planning the course, I was, um, as uh, Jackie mentioned, I was editing John Legate's Middle English translation of the French Dance Macabre. And through it, I became familiar with British Library Manuscripts Additional 37049, um, a work that I imagine will be familiar to some of the art historians on the call. A miscellany of religious works, uh, mostly in Middle English, likely produced in a Carthusian monastery in Yorkshire near the end of the 15th century. Even though religious writings can be a hard sell, this manuscript was appealing to me for a few reasons. Uh, the illustrations, some of which I've given you a sample of here, are ample, idiosyncratic, uh, and incredibly compelling. Uh, at this time, the British Library had recently digitized uh, the entire manuscript, uh, so I had access to high quality images. And uh, perhaps most important for class panic planning purposes, there was already a significant body of scholarship about the manuscript and its contents, including Jessica Brantley's wonderful 2008 monograph, Reading in the Wilderness. Brantley's work offers a synthesis of literary critical and art historical methods and provides an appendix that identifies the more than 50 texts present in AD 37049, going far beyond the level of detail in the British Library's uh, manuscript description. And Brantley also provides uh, information about other witnesses of these texts and critical editions. Uh, this was an important uh, consideration uh, because that meant she had already done a lot of the legwork uh, for me. In addition, uh, this manuscript is written almost entirely Middle English, uh, and within the broad category of, of late medieval religious writing, it contains a compelling variety of works, ranging from the long didactic poem, The Desert of Religion, to shorter pieces by Lydgate and Hockley, to brief anonymous lyrics, uh, to a prose manuscript, uh, prose excerpts, excuse me, from Mandeville's Travels. 
so this was an important consideration because I wanted my students following the lead of Brantley and other scholars of this work to be able to consider for themselves the relationship among text, image, and the physical book. So in other words, I really came into this hot. I was ready to do the most. Um, my initial approach in designing the syllabus is what I would uh, retrospectively categorize as high bandwidth, requiring quite a lot from both me and from students. I had a long list of skills that I wanted students to learn um, and a long list of tools that I wanted them to learn in order to practice those skills. For example, um, the intention was that we would use the tool uh, T-Pen, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, to kind of facilitate group transcription of some of the manuscript. In addition, rather than having all students complete work on the same sections of the manuscript, my initial plan was that after a four week introductory unit, uh, I would assign each student a subsection of the manuscript that they would work on throughout the term. Uh, during our weekly meeting, one student's uh, assigned folios would be the focus of our conversation, and they would lead discussion on its form and content. This independent work would then be synthesized in a collective presentation on the digital Map of Mundi platform, um, which I still think is great, uh, that would form the cornerstone of a presentation at Colby's annual student research symposium. And uh, from the vantage point of November, 2021, I look back on that uh, initial syllabus that I wrote, and I think, were we ever so young? When campus shut down just four weeks into our semester, it quickly became clear that this approach was not going to work. Uh, we went remote, right? Some of my students didn't have reliable internet access, making the Mapa Mundi platform extremely difficult to use. Um, in other cases, and again, I'm sure this is true across the board, time differences and work and family obligations made it uh, impossible to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings with students about their work. The student research symposium was obviously off the table, and so very quickly it became clear that we were not going to use Map and Monday. So out of necessity then, I pivoted to what I'll call a lo-fi or low bandwidth approach. Instead of trying to give students a taste of a range of approaches to manuscript study, we focused on analysis of the mise en page, the form of the text, and the content of the text. Instead of asking them to work across multiple different platforms, I moved everything to Google Drive because students could already navigate it confidently and because their Colby accounts already gave them access. So all they basically had to do was log in um, to check their email and through the tab, they could get to everything else I wanted them to use. Instead of individual students taking responsibility for a particular text and leading discussion, discussion of it on a pre-assigned week, all my students worked with the same material week by week and every week's homework asked them to answer the same questions about the week's assigned material. So after a few weeks, they knew what to expect. No longer requiring multimodal work, right? Logging into a bunch of different tools. And I gave the students the choice to complete the final project uh, in the modality. So an online presentation, a um, traditional paper or some, some other thing of their own devising uh, in the modality that made the most sense to them. So here is what this class actually looked like in practice. Uh, we did have the advantage of building on some work together on our initial assignments and readings that we completed during the first weeks of the term. And these covered key concepts for the course. So even as we moved into a more mediated mode of teaching, students had a common set of experiences to refer to. And I should note that Colby has a short term in January. And our spring semester usually runs from February to late May. So we were less far into the spring semester um, than I think a lot of folks were when COVID hit. So um, I used Clemens and Graham's excellent introduction to manuscript studies for a broader account of the production structure and use of medieval manuscripts. Um, and I also assigned the introduction and other key passages from Brantley's book to provide students with essential literary and historical context for thinking about additional 37049. As students relocated back to their parents' homes and settled into new routines, 
I also moved up a unit on critical digital humanities that I'd initially scheduled for the end of the semester. This made the remediation of manuscripts and artifacts a going concern for our group moving forward and gave students a vocabulary to talk about the affordances and limitations of the images we were working with. That said, I, it also felt really uh, timely. We spent a lot more time and had a much better discussion about this than I sort of expected we would, um, because it offered students a chance to reflect uh, more broadly on what was being gained and lost uh, as we uh, abruptly transitioned to this radically um, new reconfiguration of their intellectual and educational environment. Uh, once we resumed more regular meetings, um, in practice, this uh, low bandwidth approach looked something like this. So each week, I assign students four or five pages from the manuscript, usually comprising two texts. In a single Google Drive folder, I gave students uh, one, images from the manuscript, two, a transcription of the text, three, a video of me introducing the text and reading it out loud in Middle English. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm um, as uh, uh, elegant and direct on camera as Arthur is. Uh, four, an edited version of the text, um, ideally edited from another witness so that they could both draw on footnotes, glosses, etc. And um, when we did have our synchronous meeting, we would talk about how the edited version differed from the witness uh, that they were working in 37, within 37049. And then uh, when it was possible, I also included images uh, from those other witnesses when I could get them. And I was really helped by the um, large number of digitization programs that really got sped up uh, in spring 2020. So that was what I asked students to prepare um, before class. Um, and their homework had two parts. Um, number one, I asked them to annotate images and transcriptions using just the Google Docs comment function. Um, and two, to write and share a short response about the poems themselves. And again, this could take sort of any form they wanted. I had um, a creative writing student who frequently wrote her responses um, in poetry form. So these responses were due on Sunday night. Between Sunday and our Thursday afternoon synchronous meeting, I gave them feedback and they commented on each other's work uh, to prepare for our discussion. And this meant that uh, even for the students who weren't able to join in the synchronous session, um, that they could still read and respond to others' ideas. So um, to my surprise, and to be quite frankly honest, my relief, uh, this lo-fi approach worked better than the elaborately structured course I had originally planned for my students and begun to implement uh, during the beginning of the semester. Uh, there were some clear losses. Uh, students did not get to share their work with a wider audience. They did much less independent work than I had initially planned, um, but they did, however, build a community of practice communicating regularly with one another um, during our weekly Zoom meetings in our comments on the manuscript and um, with a kind of um, fluency and enthusiasm that totally surprised and uh, delighted me over a Discord server that I had uh, set up for the course. Um, so now it's 2021. Um, I'll be teaching this class again in uh, the spring. And I learned a few things that I'll apply the next time I teach this class, um, and which I would also sort of broadly um, recommend to anybody contemplating a similar single volume focused manuscripts class. Um, first, students learn the most uh, about those aspects of the manuscripts that they could compare directly with other witnesses, whether we were talking about text, script, or image. Second, um, the students I had in the class are about 50% English majors, with a slight edge of creative writing majors over regular lit majors, and 50% were from other departments. And for the most part, uh, they had very little experience with longer poetry. And because the goal of this class was not to get students comfortable with narrative poetry, the way that I emphasized it in say a class on the Canterbury Tales, we just, we went with the short text, it was fine. They can read Hockleaf some other time. So um, the third thing, and this probably won't surprise anyone, um, but students really did the best when they had the chance to repeatedly practice skills or methods for visual and textual analysis. The structure that I added when we went online, uh, which is mostly about keeping myself sane, 
Um, but developing a standard set of questions and materials for use when applying a particular section of the manuscripts helps students to compare different sections of the book on equivalent terms and eventually to compare um, additional 37049. I wish I had a more elegant name, uh, but to compare our book with other manuscripts. So again, uh, fall 2020, um, preparing to teach it spring 2021. Uh, we've been back on campus and meeting in person uh, since uh, fall of last year. And the collaborative in-class sessions and hands-on support that I'd originally envisioned for the class are once again possible, along with opportunities for students to share their work with the campus community. I've been playing with the new digital map of build, uh, which seems significantly more stable and uh, user friendly than the version we had available to us two years ago. Uh, all of which is to say, I'm really excited to teach this class a, time, uh, a second time, um, but I will approach it uh, with a new appreciation of the pared down experience that I had during spring of 2020. Perhaps most importantly, I recognize that I either need to lean heavily on tools for digital access that students already use regularly, like Google Docs, or build in additional time for students to learn those tools before applying them to our course materials, and certainly before applying them to our course materials in any way um, where there's an assessment component. Um, I was also surprised by how readily students responded to the materials on digitization and remediation that we read in the middle of the semester. That section is no longer an afterthought for me um, and is something that will foreground uh, across the semester. So ultimately for me, the process of planning, teaching, and then revisiting this class has been an opportunity to reflect on what it means to bring digital medieval books into the undergraduate classroom. Once I let go of a model of pedagogy that I now realize was rooted more in my experiences as a graduate student um, and as a researcher than in my goals for my own students, um, my students were able to build a community of practice, collaborate with one another, and engage in analysis that helped them to understand the relationship between text and material context. The experience of learning by doing, coming to understand new things about a text by approaching it repeatedly from multiple different perspectives, and in being in dialogue with fellow scholars uh, is the heart of why I, as a literary historian, work with manuscripts. And as a teacher and scholar committed to making the Middle Ages a vital and vibrant part of my students' education, this experience is uh, the rare thing from 2020 that I hope to build into my teaching going forward. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that, Megan. That was really um, fascinating. Uh, to hear about. And, and one thing that's that's really striking to me based on what you're saying is um, how the remote versions um, of classes such as as you're describing it can take a, on, on even a, a more kind of like conceptual materiality than like a live class might. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of like the Google Docs where like you've all of a sudden like the content is being both conveyed and responded to in the form of this virtual folder and you're inserting things into it and you're thinking about the different media and the students can comment in various ways whether through voice or through writing on things and everybody sees what they're doing in a way that's I mean that, that we see in medieval manuscripts right where we have all of like the the different hands and annotating things and passing it on to the next guy um, it's really interesting as opposed to like a regular classroom meeting where the students might be taking their own notes, but once you're out of that classroom, if they haven't taken notes, that material is lost. Yeah. Um, no, I haven't thought about that um, manuscript analogy explicitly before, but that's absolutely right. And I'm going to steal that moving forward. Uh, one <laughs> Excellent. Good. Well, we can talk about more of this, this meta stuff, I think, in the larger discussion, um, but we want now to move on. Um, to Eurydice Giorgantili, who is an art historian, numismatist, and digital curator whose research and teaching encompasses in medieval art, the archaeology of the Crusades, economic history and numismatics, the curation of cultural heritage, and digital storytelling. Prior to her current appointment as lecturer in art history and numismatics in the Department of History art, of Art and Architecture at Harvard, she was keeper of coins at the Barber Institute of Fine Arts and lecturer on Byzantine studies at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Um, she's held curatorial positions at numerous places, including the British Museum in London and the Fitzwilliam at Cambridge. 
um, and her she's uh, been responsible for curating numerous high profile exhibitions. Um, and she's the author of a book called Encounters, Travel and Money in the Byzantine World, co-authored with Barry Cook, uh, which, which uh, appeared in 2006 and uh, has been the recipient of the Royal Numismatic Society Prize. Uh, specialists in the arts of Southeastern Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean, Eurydice uses archeological evidence, written sources, and the changing patterns in transport geography to trace economic and cultural exchange in the ancient and medieval world. It would seem like this is a very um, sort of difficult field of study to bring into remote teaching because it's so hands-on and it has so much to do with the size and shape and physical presence of things, but it sounds like you have been bridging this gap for a while in terms of digital humanities. And we're excited to hear about your teaching um, in this pandemic time and, uh, and beyond. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Jackie. Uh, I would like to thank Sean Gilstorf and Alex Miller for the kind invitation. Um, pedagogy during the pandemic has been uh, challenging. And today I would like to reflect on a period catalyzed and paralyzed for the humanities by the pandemic. So my contribution focuses on the principles that underpinned my pedagogy the strategies, the tools and resources I employed, the good friends I made, and the learning outcomes of these courses articulated in very unfiltered student reflections. So um, my intellectual and professional and pedagogical profile, if you like, uh, have been shaped by training as a field archaeologist. So for me, not to touch objects, as Sean said before, is like anathema. I simply love handling objects and retain the same curiosity, sense of wonder, imagination and enthusiasm as when I first started my career. My training in digital humanities means that I have been able to devise platforms and discuss with techies about the possibilities and impossibilities of combining traditional humanities with new technologies. And then this doubling between the cultural and the educational sector has always been underpinned by the principles, at least in the UK, of accessibility and social and educational equity. So when the pandemic started, did I make use of all these kind of skills and profile? I think I mostly use two others. The first one is my identity as the child of an educational psychologist. Art is therapy. And at the heart of my father's approach lay the principle of inclusion that ensures that diverse learners are exposed to teaching strategies that reach them as individuals. And then a wonderful saying, by my new friend, Theocritus, third century BC Greek poet, Penia Technas Katergazete. This is particularly true from embattled Greece, but I think necessity is the mother of invention was our motto during the pandemic. Now, I'm certain many of you uh, can recall the feeling of helplessness and mild panic at the prospect of teaching without libraries, works of arts, archive, and with our students invited to embark on a journey while they were stranded across the globe in different time zones, living and health conditions, and while trying to address mental health issues and learning challenges. The pandemic found me at the beginning of a semester long sabbatical, which of course was ruined. I was devastated. The first casualties, as you may recall, were the libraries that remained closed for the best part of 18 months. And the second ones, museums and collections closed, inaccessible, out of limit. Considering that libraries, archives and collections are not workspaces, storerooms or depositories of past cultures, but the laboratories of the humanities, you can appreciate my acute frustration and anxiety. 
As a learner, my sabbatical had just ended abruptly. And as an instructor, I was puzzled as to how I could deliver effective and compelling courses of the highest intellectual level. So you can see here prior, prior, uh, previous kind of iterations of my courses, engaging museum collections, art making in the ceramic studio, observation close up of objects, you name it. So all these have always been part of the fabric of the courses, kinesthetic experience, sound, performance, storytelling. So how do you go from this to this? And the 2D capabilities of a computer screen in a tiny home office. So it took a lot of consideration, testing, discarding methods and tools, and visualizing the ultimate destination, which is an uplifting teaching environment, which could encourage active participation, personalized learning, debates, storytelling, art making, and community building. The digital tools. In all four courses, that is from Byzantium to the British Isles, the materiality of late antiquity, at cross purposes, the crusades in material culture, whose culture, the curation and management of world heritage and money matters, I employed three distinct tools. The Omega platform or an iteration of the Omega platform, digital curation and podcasts. Now, in all these tools, all these tools have tremendous kind of benefits for the students' participants. They help them situate an array of works of art, monuments and sites in their geographical, historical and architectural context. Students can appreciate the medieval world as a pluralistic and interconnected landscape of religious, political beliefs and economic and artistic practices. Students can also explore different parts of their own story. Each of us is the product of so many different layers of heritage and stories. Can we make meaningful connections between the different threads of our story? I think the study of the past, the study of material culture provides the most powerful connection. So, the Harvard History of Art and Architecture created this instantiation of the Omega platform, an open source web publishing platform, as you may know, for sharing digital collections and creating media rich online exhibits. It was a change game. And we created this instance of the platform to compensate for the lack of images and media management on Canvas a digital learning platform used by Harvard. Now, if you have ever worked with Canvas, you can appreciate its limited uh, built-in functionality for images. Users can upload and embed images, but viewers have no opportunity to interact with them. And I wanted them badly to interact. Also, the option to Zoom is limited in most browsers preventing detailed looking of high resolution images. So our instantiation of this platform developed by Marcus Mayo, a big shout out, IT Supremo of History of Art and Architecture and Jeremy Gilliette, Instructional Technology at Harvard, currently consists of, sorry, of three components, an image media collection management platform, and both the TFs and myself spent a lot of time and thought every single week, every single class to select and upload images from museum collections ac across the globe, using very often the IIIF, but not solely. We also include a description for use individually and as part of a digitally thematic aggregation of objects. The IIIF server 
This one defines several application programming interfaces that provide a standardized method of describing and delivering images over the web. And by using IIIF, we were able to import our images and image collections into different web applications, allowing us and our students to take, if you like, our work with us from one class to another. And last but not least, we had the Mirador Viewer, which is an open source, web-based, multi-window image viewing platform. We can zoom, we can display, we can compare, and we can annotate images. Mirador discourages the passive viewing of image collections and allows users to interact with the objects on display and with each other. This was the subject of conversation for each breakout room. How wonderful the Mirador viewer is and let's zoom and let's discuss these objects. The use of this platform enhanced digital pedagogy in several ways. Students were encouraged to use this in class to deepen engagement. They could follow my analysis of an object or an image on their own personal computer or mobile device. They use the platform to develop collection manager management and curation. They were added as content creators to the platform and they were tasked with creating galleries. See here, what I was desperately trying to do was to emulate this kind of conviviality and inclusiveness we had, we enjoyed, let's say, in the fine arts library when studying facsimile or in the uh, museum, um, at the Harvard Art Museum. The platform was incorporated into student assessments so that participants could directly engage with objects using annotations. And it was equally effective for group assignments and breakout rooms. Another tool I used was podcasts. Podcasts are therapeutic. They were created by students uh, for my crusades class on select monuments. Let's say the Sumela Monastery near Trapzon on the Black Sea sites, the Crusader Castle of Clarenza in the Peloponnese and works of art such as the Cadua Shroud. These podcasts were made possible thanks to workshops and individual training sessions we organized in collaboration with the Learning Lab of the Box Center for Learning and Teaching at Harvard. For their podcasts, students used Scholar, the free open source authoring and publishing platform, audio editing tools such as Audacity and GarageBand, their laptop, their mobile phone and lots of imagination. The students call this both the most challenging and therapeutic experience. Developing a script that could, that could reach a global audience in a period of confinement was liberating. Finding their own voice was liberating. Discovering music that would effectively complement their narrative was liberating. And of course, get training in audio auditing was a great bonus. Digital curation, and this is an example from my course, Whose Culture. So you can see here that this is a, a, a platform that explores culture in a very different way, not only according to themes or let's say regions, allow students to um, start connecting the dots. They allow the, it allows them to adopt a cross-regional approach and analysis, which is terribly important. And this particular platform relates the management of world heritage to some of the most consequential social issues of the modern world. We talked about Palmyra, Hagia Sophia, the uh, Acropolis and the Parthenon marbles. And to visualize all this and to convey this information 
in a slick platform, I thought it was terrific. Now, I'm their teacher. Of course, I can say whatever, but did these approaches work? The creation of the digital platforms encouraged students curators to adopt these methods of cross-regional, transnational, and transcultural modes. Um, on Scholar and WordPress, students found multiple avenues to critically rethink the art and periods under study. They took agency of their work by developing solutions. They acquired fluency and communicated their work effectively and imaginatively in the digital space. So the podcast and the digital curation led to some of the students getting jobs after graduation as digital managers, educational officers, and museum assistants. I back some wonderful summer internships, also digital internships on related subjects. As for the Omega platform, these are some of the thoughts of the students. Amazing digital resources led to robust conversations. And I think this was one of the most kind of gravest challenges of the pandemic, how we engage people in different time zones, in different regions, regions confined in different places to conversations, how we make them feel part of the community. Ron Blanco, who was zooming in from China, he kept talking about community building. And indeed, he was looking forward to zoom in in the most ungodly hours. One of the other tools I explored was, of course, virtual visits to museums. If all my courses were anchored previously in museum objects, I needed to have objects to handle. And every solution proposed by museum colleagues, I felt it was terribly unsatisfactory. They talked about a glorified PowerPoint. I needed more. I needed someone who could handle an object in front of our eyes and convey the emotions that relate, you know, the viewer with the object. And we were very fortunate to be invited by Dr. Betsy Williams, who is the curator for Byzantine art at Dumbarton Oaks. By taking us to the inner sanctum one March day of Dumbarton Oaks, she led us to a journey of discovery of late antique textiles and jewelry. And this was not only rewarding for the students, but they felt that they were part of this journey. It was a great success, lifted up spirits, as you can see, from what they wrote afterwards. This was for some the best class of the semester. This connection with objects they missed all for an entire academic year. And now here they are led by Betsy and handling courtesy of Betsy, these precious golden bracelets and these textiles found in Alexandria. The same was true for a visit to the atelier of Stephen Sack in Brussels. Stephen came to our class, or we went to his atelier on my birthday in April. He's an award-winning visual artist who has been investigating for the past 35 years and creating really hypnotic art anchored in money in its many and complex manifestations. His exhibitions, his works of art, have featured in major collections across Europe. What was the reaction? Well, Stephen was mobbed by students. And the most uh, uh, encouraging one feeling was the fact that the, the most silent students were the most garrulous in that particular session, asking him que questions that slowly peeled away layers of inactivity and reluctance to engage and allow me as their teacher to better understand their and 
last but not least, I would like to mention art making. Thanks to lovely grants prior to the pandemic, I was able to take my students to the Harvard Ceramic Studio. We created pots and we create lamps and we had a blast. But what do you do during the pandemic? Well, a little help from my friends, that is Dr. Kathy King, she's the director of the Harvard Ceramic Studio, and lots of persistence. How should we do this? We sent these kits to every single student within who lives, of course, in the US. For students abroad, we just send them the same list and we ask them to replace this material with makeup stuff they could find at home. The visit was a great success again. And she was able to convey the emotions of the makers. And she was able to encourage people to actually make. And this is a screenshot of two students uh, furiously making these pots and having a great time. So an array of students from classics, art history, government studies, economics, were able to engage with material. And most importantly, they were able to make something which they then they proudly displayed on their desk. During a period of pandemic, when we feel claustrophobic and helpless, it makes sense to engage with something that empowers us. And this was one such activity. So to sum up, this was a, an academic year not like no other. It's built on their strengths, became more organized, delved deeper in the historical periods and cultures in questions reflected effectively on primary sources because they were confined, so no lots of extracurricular activities, like a monastic setting, took agency of their work, and thrive in a learning environment that had lots to offer. Moving from online to in-person teaching, I feel this semester the excitement of someone who is coming out of the plague and really wants to offer students everything the pandemic took away. So my classes this semester, despite the masking and world, we all look like Robin Hood, we are now back in the study center of the Harvard Art Museums. But some of the lovely lessons we learned about art making, about contemplative time, I started applying them now in these courses. So I, I ask them regularly to sit quietly in the galleries and just draw medieval objects. I feel that the time spent in spaces that have been denied to us for such a long time can only be a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eurydice, for this uh, really amazing presentation. Um, I'm actually like one of, I, this is a very banal point, but one of the things I'm very grateful for about the pandemic era is the possibility to do uh, meetings like this on Zoom and to be able to record them because I know that I'm going to be going back to your talk many times and I expect that there's going to be a big audience for this to learn from you some of these really amazing and effective methods of, um, of teaching with objects. Uh, this has been really fascinating and enlightening. And one of the things that I'm struck by in both of your um, presentations today, Eurydice and Megan, um, is the way, and this, this ties into a question, but I think it goes, it goes deeper. Um, it, and it's precisely it, within this particular unit, since we're talking about media and, and the materialities of communication you know, across time, um, that you both, um, along with, with many of the rest of us who deal, deal with material objects, are trying to find new media 
for community. We're all, I mean, those of us who aren't working in museums all the time are always working with slides and ways of projecting things that are far away and bringing them close and things like that. But we have these new challenges now. And what we're seeing here are some amazing possibilities that are not just stopgap measures to get us through this crisis period and then we'll just leave them all behind. But what I'm seeing are really creative and transformative ways of sharing things with students and eliciting student engagement. I, I mean, I was, I was struck too. I mean, I, was, I, I feel very connected with what you were saying just about the um, students sort of coming out of the woodwork in the discussion forums who don't normally talk in class. This is something that is always difficult with in-person teaching. How do you, if there's a lively conversation going on, how do you get that person who's always quiet to pipe up and say something? How do I know what they're thinking? If you're using discussion boards and having them do responses to things before the class, they're able, I saw so many students bubbling up with all of these things to say who would never talk in class themselves. Likewise, when you're at, a, at, a, at an artist studio or you're in a rare book room and sh showing students these very delicate and small things. Um, I'm at the Beinecke, I was just at the Beinecke Library the other day, we're looking at the Rothschild Canticles. You can't just hold it up and let them all see it equally. There are people who are being blocked by other people. They can't get close enough. They're too shy to get close. If you're doing things on the screen, they all have access in a way that is more active and engaged, even though they're missing out on other things. So all of this is to say that I love the way that you're able to show us, both of you, how you uh, exploited this time to develop, tr again, ways of showing, making the material look different and be accessible in really new and exciting ways that can help pedagogy, not just bring it up to the same level, but actually enhance what we're doing. Um, I'd love to hear more of your kind of meta reflections on this, if you have them before we open up to the full uh the full room uh because i realize we're running running short of time but thank you both so much for these wonderful explorations um thank you so much dear jackie uh i think all started with necessity right yeah or penury because uh, uh we have been always uh been i don't know not well provided in humanities uh, if access to labs was uh, a must for other disciplines, we could not have access to libraries and to study centers. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt that the pandemic provided, as you said, a great opportunity to think outside the confines mm -hmm. of our teaching methods, of who we are. Also, Megan said, you know, we teach very often the things that we like and the way we like it. Mm -hmm. And then we started feeling more in tune with the needs of our students and how we can make material more and more accessible. And I think this is a, uh, something we need in humanities, especially because we have been accused of not reaching out to other disciplines or that we become irrelevant, I don't know. So Money Matters was a lecture course and I had no a single art historian in my course. Mm -hmm. Everyone was from mathematics, economics, government, astrophysics. Mm -hmm. How can you make these people feel engaged without mm -hmm. um, this um, sensorial experience, which was a, always a great selling point of the course, mm -hmm. and make them feel that they have to take agency of everything. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the take away from me, which I didn't include in my presentation, is never to take myself seriously anymore. Yeah. For money matters. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, storytelling is important. So what the heck, I was dressed one day as Diocletian <laughs> or as a female, a kind of um, representation of Diocletian. I issued my decree on mm -hmm. prices and uh, we had a senatorial discussion and debate and everyone came dressed up and they Fantastic. did amazing stuff. Amazing. That sounds like so much fun. Yeah, I think, I think that like this humor aspect is important. 
because there's a sense of absurdity, like the whole teaching, this goes back to what we were talking about before, the whole teaching from home thing where your kid can come in at any time, your cat might walk across the desk and have his tail sticking up or whatever. Like there's this kind of element of absurdity. And it's like, why not just own this and have, have fun and be silly and be human. <laughs> I feel like there's something humanizing about Zoom in a very weird way. Um, but uh, Megan, I wanted to make sure that you... Yeah, just following on that, I would say um, one thing when we had our synchronous sessions, we started um, each session with a, a pet check-in. Um, nice. And so in the, I think there were about a dozen students who would regularly be able to make those. And there were birds, there was a bunny, um, there were like many dogs, many cats. Um, and again, it was humanizing, right? Um, yeah. But um, two things I would just um, add uh, in response to your comment that sort of came out of this um, experience for me is number one, students are totally ready and eager to talk about like digital mediation as not just something that involves, um, you know, their experiences during the pandemic, but that's something that's a fundamental part of their life mm -hmm. and the way that they engage with media and ideas, mm -hmm. um, both academically and extracurricularly. And so I was just blown away by the appetite that my students had for those conversations um, and the um, kind of sophistication and insight that they were able to, to bring to them pretty much across the board. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that on this topic of access, um, teaching this class under the circumstances that I did taught me a lot about how varied um, my students' degree of tech savviness is. Mm. Um, I think we often go into this um, teaching, assuming, oh, they're all digital natives, they know how to do it. That is absolutely not the case. Yeah. And I was, you know, I'm sort of um, embarrassed to admit this because it feels like I should have appreciated it earlier, right? But, you know, I teach first year writing. We talk about um, universal syllabus design. We talk about universal design for learning. Um, and I was not thinking about that in this class. And when mm -hmm. I come to um, revisit uh, the syllabus as I prepare to teach it again this spring, um, there's so much I wanna rethink from that accessibility standpoint. And it's not just, um, you know, do students have the technological tools that they need? Um, you know, one really uh, easy example is um, I had a student in the class who um, struggles with, with ADHD and it was a continual, it, it's a very smart person, but um, a continual issue for them to keep track of all their logins. Um, and mm. so I was, when I was like, okay, I need you to sign up for these three, you know, different accounts to do the work this week. That was just like a very paralyzing moment for them. Yeah. And there's no reason um, that it has to be that way. So it really highlighted some stuff I'll think about differently moving yeah. forward, not just in teaching um, this class, but in any class that has a kind of um, digital approach to materiality component. Fantastic. Thank you. I see that Miriam has her hand up. Hi, um, I'm sorry, I, I, there's background noise again. Um, but I also wanted to say I apologize. I feel like I'm being the dark voice always <clears throat> so far. But I don't wanted to ask if we have time and we might not have time, both of our speakers, if there's anything kind of negative about this experience, not in terms of the anything that was lost for the students because you made it very clear in your very rich presentations that um, the students ended up having an incredible experiences in both your, your classes. But in terms of how coming out of the pandemic, institutions might feel that there's no need to provide access to, especially in your case, material culture, right because so much can be done online. And I'll give you an example mm -hmm. um, from my institution. My institution is, is undergoing um, terrible financial um, trouble right now. And um, 18 tenured faculty members were fired this summer. And, um, and that's not all we lost. That's just the ones that were fired. Um, and part and, and when and in, our, in my department in the English department we lost all of our Americanists and we were told that it was okay because now that we could ask someone from um, a, a regional school to um, teach courses online for our students to have access to American literature oh God. so in part it felt like you know the administration felt um, able to um, to fire perhaps more people than they would have otherwise because suddenly it was it, it seemed appropriate to them for them to tell us you know just ask an, an a regional institution 
so many miles away to teach your course and, and we can do that now. So I was just wondering, especially since you're working with material culture where access to objects is so important, if you feel like there's any danger that anything in, that the message might kind of warp into something negative from this institutional perspective, if that makes sense, I'm sorry. Did I, uh, I, could I start? Uh, so um, at Harvard, I think there was such a great desire, Mariam, to, to go back to uh, the museums because uh, uh, they lost, they lost their audience for two years. So, and also uh, FAS, they really want to market the humanity. So how do you market them? Um, so you market them by saying, an art historian can really earn good money in Wall Street, but they need to hone the art of observation. So I don't see the danger of uh, uh, going online or replacing the in-person experience and this sensorial experience with uh, lectures and then uh, uh, checking up whether the students have filled in stuff. But my fear is that uh, institutionally the university will go back not supporting us, let's say, with all these resources. Mm -hmm. So the box center was fantastic and I was the best client probably and they helped me develop this podcast series. Are they now going to do the same? Um, and then is mm -hmm. the university going to invest on maintaining and developing this exciting instantiation of the Omega platform. Yeah. What I saw as soon as I came back was that, that the platform was gone. And then I, I kicked mm -hmm. a very big fuss and it was reinstated. This should not be the case. We should strive instead to apply even for funding and European grants. Mm -hmm. I am from Europe, right? And there is a lot of... Um, um, kind of um, cross pond uh, uh, collaboration in order to enhance this experience. Think that the Louvre has just released half a million digital objects. This is fantastic. We should take this as a, take this as an opportunity, mm -hmm. but we need the uh, institutional support and we need grants. I mean, Marcus Mayo is fantastic, but we don't need people to work flat out on a volunteer basis. We want people to feel empowered and be acknowledged for what they do. So if I can just um, answer, um, first of all, Miriam, as someone who is currently like preparing their department staffing request for next year, um, the fight for like historical coverage in English departments is really real. And um, my heart goes out to you and your colleagues. Um, I mentioned in my talk that this is, I don't know, the third or fourth time um, that I've, I've talked about this class. And most of those presentations um, have been internal. And I really do believe that one thing faculty can do um, to kind of push back against this is to get on the same page um, about the importance of resources, whether it's we need someone actually in the classroom, um, we need access to um, material objects of study, we need access to Omeka or whatever, is to, to talk to one another so that, um, you know, even my colleagues who um, have no interest in uh, building an annotated version of a 15th century miscellany uh, in digital map, but know that it's a thing that you can do and see how the students that they also have in their classes um, can benefit from, from those um, experiences. So I think talking to one another, building solidarity, um, doing actually exactly what we're doing today, right? Having a conversation with one another um, about pedagogy is one small but practical um, step that we can take um, in that direction. Thank you for that question, Miriam. That was that was it's <laughs> obviously within the celebration. There, it, it's crucial to be thinking about the very, very real flip side um, of this. No, no, no. It's really important. No apologies uh, necessary. Um, are there other questions? I see Sean's hand up. We've got a couple minutes. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a real quick question. I, I find myself, I, I taught a course, Eurydice knows this last term, 
during the pandemic, which also have a heavy, I'd always wanted to do a, a material culture component of a course I teach on queenship and never had done it largely because I had, this is the, the weird, this is that weird two sides of the coin, right? The, there was something in a way liberating about being on Zoom in that I no longer felt obligated to be using on-campus resources and which is the like talk about the ultimate sort of like poor mouthing. I'm in an institution that has libraries and museums, right? We have medieval stuff. And so you yeah, feel yeah. kind of like obligated to use it because your student, that's, you know, what your students are there for, but we couldn't, right? The museum was closed. The libraries were closed. You couldn't take them there. So I was like, oh, well now I can actually do this because I don't feel any obligation to use the stuff we have. Cause it turns out the stuff we have on our own campus doesn't really fit. Um, mm -hmm. But stuff that's all over the world does. And so in a way, it was just this kind of, it was relieving in a way like, oh, well, I can just do this with this, with global stuff and no one will fault me for it. Um, but at the same time, I did realize, and I'm curious about your take, both of your take on this. And I think you've, you've both talked about in, in, in ways, working virtually with material culture is enormously time consuming just in terms. And I, know, I think anybody who here who's worked with vi virtual objects just to the curation of it. And then the creation of what I had to do in my class was create dossiers for the students on the objects they were working on to provide them with the background and information they need because I couldn't trust that they didn't have library resources. And, you know, Hathi Trust is okay, but it doesn't have everything you need. There's lots of stuff that they don't know about. There's no way for them to find it. Um, their bibliographers weren't really accessible. And there's just so, so many ways that you just ended up having to do a lot of legwork just to make these experiences possible. And I don't think, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it is something that I don't think administrators and certainly our colleagues think about when we think about workload. Mm -hmm. You know, doing teaching one of these classes online is like the work of one and a half classes in person. I I found I was spending way, 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 way more time outside of class on my classes, and especially ones with visual material. Um, and I'm just thinking this goes, I guess, to to Megan's point that in the sense we have to be speaking out. And getting our colleagues on the same page saying, hey, remember how crappy that was and how much, how much harder we had to work? If they want us to keep doing this, which a lot of institutions do, like, oh, this is great. Now do more of that. Then they have to, there's got, you know, they have to put their money where their mouth is. And, you know, we're always saying that about these things. But I think it's just important to raise it again. Because it's not a zero, it's not just a free, it's not a freebie. People act like virtual learning is a freebie. And it's not. It costs a lot of money and it costs a lot of time. And time, frankly, is money, and we shouldn't just shortchange ourselves. Gerdesi's point is well taken. People shouldn't be expected to work for free to do brilliant mm -hmm. things for, like, maybe a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Sean, I, I fully agree about the, the Global Museum. Uh, and I also think that this has made uh, our colleagues uh, um, in the museum sector more kind of humble and perceptive or receptive. So now my list of objects for every week is probably a list of 30 objects. And it's never a problem because they are so keen to have these classes back that we can see everything. We can see from Dürer to textiles from Venice and 19th century um, rendition of Saint-Chapelle by a British traveler. Um, doing things for free. We have done so much work for every single class. I think in my case, it was probably like three classes in one. And then I never thought that it was, it was good enough for my students to just have um, something recorded because they would have missed this interaction with the Omega platform, with myself, with her, their fellow students. So if someone was sick, I had to organize a one-to-one -one tutorial. And I asked the TFs to do exactly the same. And then we were checking on every single individual to make sure they're okay. Yeah. So uh, I feel always that the humanities is like, um, I don't know, we can do things for nothing or it's for free and our time is not money. But as I double as an economic historian, I now shown a militant, our time is money and we should capitalize on this. And we should ask for more. We should ask for digital resources. And as Megan said, we should just be out there and say, I can provide content, but I need the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure to convey this content. 
they can. Um, I would just follow up that 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 infrastructure is key, right? Um, I think many of us probably have that on the mind uh, more broadly uh, today. But uh, some of the things I would say to follow that up um, is that those of us who um, have been working with materiality for a long time um, from campuses without um, medieval materials um, have ideas about how to do this and streamline yeah. it. You know, and it's really been an iterative process, yeah. right? So I think that the pandemic um, you know, sped up a lot of things, um, but I've had the advantage of figuring out over a number of years um, how to build that into um, uh, my, my pedagogy. The other thing that made this a successful course for me was that about um, a month into it, um, I found out that I had gotten tenure, right? And the job security and the not being worried um, about, so, I mean, this is a labor issue is what I'm saying, yeah. is that, yes. um, if institutions um, want more from their faculty, then um, they need to offer um, job security and the sense that you know you will be able to come back and um, teach a class um, again and work it out. Um, and I, I just don't think that there's a way out of that, um, you know, labor economy. So, Jackie, I think we need to wrap things up I here. think yeah but it looks like we're already again, we're over, we're part over of this time, time or this good conversation so we're at time yes yeah, so I'm sorry I will not be able to be uh in attendance for the rest of the um for this afternoon's events but I look forward to keeping up on them uh retroactively uh via the, the recordings and uh, I thank everybody again for participating this was re really wonderful and um Sean over to you oh thank you <laughs> So yeah, so it's uh, it's time for lunch. So I um, everybody enjoy the break. We will come back. We're on the schedule at twelve forty-five just for our final topical panel on the teaching of history uh, with Jeannie Peterson and Jesse Torgerson, uh, and then we will go to our roundtable. But in the meantime, uh, thank you all, all of our panelists this morning, to all of our facilitators, um, to Nicholas, to Rajini, to everyone who's been here this morning, and. Um, Looking forward to some exciting and uh, provocative conversations this afternoon. And I'm looking forward to eating something right now. So I will see you all on the other side of lunch. So thank you. Thanks, everybody.